All right. So this here is the Legislative Matters meeting of December 14, 2020. I'm City Councilor Bill Dwight. I'm the chair, and I will be presiding today. Um, if first, um, I would ask Laura to be kind enough to call the roll to determine if we have a quorum. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Shara. Here. Councilor Mayori. Here. And Councilor Thorpe. Here. Okay, so for the purposes of informed consent, I want to notify everyone that this uh, this video conference is being recorded, audio and visually. So uh, if you want to re remain anonymous, um, don't turn on your camera or your, <laughs> and you should be okay. Or also get rid of your name. But um, so we, we start with public comment. Now the public comment, in um, legislative matters runs a little differently than um, uh, city council. And so we, we provide some latitude, um, a little more flexibility if, if, but my requests are, and actually we ask that you for the public record first identify yourself by name and then tell us the city or town where you live. I don't need any more specificity on your address. And, and then um, please keep your comments relative to the issue that you're describing um, and talk to the issue. Hopefully we're going to keep the comments focused on the agenda here. So the, unlike the council where you can, you can do a free verse and whatever, you can you know, say anything about anything, we're, we're a little more focused here, so please, uh, speak to agenda items. And I'm, I'm guessing most of the public comments are going to be focused on one agenda item in particular. Um, and before I proceed with public comment, uh, just to give everyone a heads up, there are two other items at the bottom of the agenda that we're going to take considerably less time to address. And I would beg everyone's indulgence if they would allow us to move those two items up. So um, first, before we address the, the uh, Plastic Reduction and Sustainability Ordinance. So anyway, so first, um, if you want to speak, please indicate uh, your desire by raising your hand or, and Council Shara, help me, what's the process by which you uh, do the hand raising feature if you're on a phone? Um, star nine, if you're on a phone, I don't see any people calling in on a phone though. Um, and then if you if you click on the participants button at the bottom of your screen, so down at the bottom, it should open up a window that has participants. At the bottom of that, you'll have a raise hand button. Alternately, if your camera's on, you can simply raise your hand. If, if that's. So is there anyone who wishes to speak at public comment? Rich, you're up. And Kathy's going to unmute you. <laughs> there you go. Hello, my name is uh, Rich Cooper. I live in Florence. I own State Street Fruit Store, Deli Wines and Spirits in Cooper's Corner. I ask that you not recommend this proposed ordinance to the full council. I agree that public waste must be curtailed. However, this proposed ordinance is the wrong solution at the wrong time. The proposed ordinance places Northampton businesses, community in an untenable position. There are some containers we use now for which there are no alternatives exist. <laughs> As show and tell, we use clamshell containers a lot, particularly during COVID where their individual items cannot be grabbed by a customer. They can't grab a single donut, they can't grab a single sandwich, they can't grab um, a single muffin. Everything needs to be packaged. The only way to do that for us is to have it in these clamshells so that they're they're visible. They can't be in a paper bag because no one's going to buy a sandwich in a paper bag. It just says, this is roast beef. There are other plastics for which alternatives don't exist. Um, you know, they're, or they exist, but they're extremely expensive. Um, I'm thinking of compostable uh, forks, knives, spoons, those sorts of things. It's a small you know, cost per unit, but it adds up. Um, even if we were to be able to identify affordable alternatives for products we currently use, we're at the mercy of a highly unreliable supply, supply chain. 
Um, I mean, you've all seen that, you know, there's a shortage of, of toilet paper and there's a shortage of toothpaste and there's a shortage of dishwasher detergent. Well, there's also a shortage of, of plastic gloves that we or disposable gloves that we use in the deli. There's a shortage of glass. And we've noticed now that pasta sauces we're getting in are coming in in cans because there's a shortage of glass. Um, it's just, it goes on and on. And we don't know when there's going to be an end to this. Even when the pandemic is over, there's still going to be a, a supply chain shortage. There's going to be a, a, quite a while for uh, for our suppliers and manufacturers to catch up with all of this. The six month discretionary exemptions aren't really sufficient release. They're just relief. They're discretionary. We can't rely on obtaining one. And the six month time period, there's no real relationship to whether or not an affordable, suitable alternative is actually available. Passing this ordinance at this time ignores the existential threats faced by restaurants and food establishments right now and disregards the reality of running a business in this pandemic. From the beginning of this pandemic, restaurants and food retailers have shut down, reopened, recalibrated, calibrated, pivoted so many times we're permanently dizzy in unending efforts to provide our services to our customers while complying with the necessary and important regulations and protocols that keep us all safe and healthy. We've balanced employee needs and customer needs. We've worked longer hours, experienced greater stress over an extended period of time than ever before. We worry about our employees and their families. We don't want them to get sick. We worry about our customers. Are we meeting their needs as well as we're able to? Many of our business community have closed the doors for good. Others have closed for now with no certainty that they're gonna open again. We're exhausted. We need a break and we don't need yet another obstacle to overcome. Please do not recommend this ordinance to the full council. We all agree that there's, we need to do something about the waste stream. We need to do something about the planet, but now is not the time. If you feel you must advance a plastic limiting ordinance, I ask that you disregard this one and in its place offer an ordinance that charges an appropriate city commission or department with assisting businesses to create plastic reduction plans on a voluntary basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Judy, you're on mute. You're muted, yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. I feel like a Verizon commercial. Okay, um, I agree with everything that Rich Cooper just said, um, but I'm gonna add a few things. Um, for, and I'm gonna give concrete examples also like Rich did. We have biodegradable cups for ice cream. The lids are, all P, are not PLA plastic, but PET plastic. There is no alternative made. I've talked to seven different manufacturers, including um, Yo Cup, Dart, Solo, Humakonami, and um, so uh, I forget the one that's in the grocery store, Dixie. All of them have said there's no need for those lids to be compostable. They have no reason evidently to make them compostable. They hear from businesses saying their customers want them, but they don't hear from the customers. This is the attitude that at least I've been hitting. Um, we are uh, unique in the sense that we ship ice cream, which requires dry ice, which requires styrofoam by federal law. The only thing FedEx or UPS can use to ship something in dry ice is styrofoam. So is a styrofoam container that's put into a cardboard box. If we can't get them from some of our other suppliers, we will get them locally. Uh, Stop and Shop actually carries them, but won't if this ordinance goes through. So that's going to make us rely on more expensive, have to go out and order in advance and not allow us to, to take an order at the last minute and ship it. It's going to, again, it's not a huge crippling effect, but it's a somewhat crippling effect in, in an urgency. So that's not a good thing. Straws, the straw problem is one, an ADA issue. We, we carry three types of straws. We carry paper straws, we carry plastic straws, and we carry boba straws. Some people like the boba straws because they're wider. And if you have like a bubble tea or a really double thick milkshake, you can suck through them. If you use a paper straw on a milkshake, you need for a large milkshake, you need three. We've tested this. On a small milkshake, you need two. And at eight cents a piece, instead of two cents a piece, 
that's 24 cents a piece for a large cup and 16 cents a piece for a small cup for a milkshake versus two cents for the whole milkshake and that straw. It's gonna make it also difficult for people that are disabled who come in and request the plastic flexi straws. So um, that that's a bad idea. Yes, I know they're not good in the landfill and for the sea, I get that. We're looking, everybody's looking for some kind of economical and usable alternative, but there isn't one out there yet. Um, the other, one of the other things that I wanted to bring up was the fact that the compostable plastics, which we're being asked to get instead are anywhere from three to five times the cost of a regular plastic. And I know Rich and myself, we've been looking into this for 40 years or more. We, every time we can find an alternative that's cost effective, we get it and we put it in. I mean, biodegradable cups, the lids are a problem. Paper straws, we have those, but we also have the other alternatives. Um, and there's lots of examples of things that we do do to help the environment. Compostable plastics is not a good option. Here's why. A compostable spoon in, a, in ice cream, that's hard ice cream, not medium or not soft ice cream, but hard ice cream, like Harold's ice creams, breaks and splinters in the ice cream. The splinters go into the ice cream and you can't always see them to pick them out. We've been working with those manufacturers trying to stiffen them, make them harder and less flexible so they don't splinter and break. So far, they just haven't gotten there yet. They're working on it, but there's no, we don't have a date when, or a time span when we know they're gonna be ready. But also generally compostable plastics are still plastics. And what's really needed is education of the public, not to cause more problems for restaurant owners that are going out of their minds right now anyway. Um, Northampton, the city of, does not have a compostable plastics program, which can't go in. Those plastics cannot go into your home compostables. You need for 5,000 square feet of compostable plastics that cannot be buried and require moisture and sun to decompose. You need 50,000 square feet of compostable organic material. So until Northampton comes up with a method of composting these plastics, having us only sell compostable so the general public who still doesn't understand and puts them in the plastic recycling where they'll just go into the landfill anyway, it doesn't seem to make sense. We're putting the cart before the horse. Um, I think working with Recycle Works, working with the state, looking, working with the businesses downtown, putting a committee together to specific of business owners and experts in the field to come together to make a more informed and reasonable ordinance would be the way to go. Now is definitely, as Rich pointed out, not the time. Um, I think we would have a lot of business owners at this meeting if one, they knew about it, two, if it wasn't at five o'clock, because between five and six, most of Main Street is closing right now. If it wasn't early in the morning when they're trying to get up and open for business, I think they need to be in the evening after most businesses close in order for them to be available. Because like me and like Rich, we have less, custom, less customers, but more employees right now. And we're also acting as employees where usually we hire somebody to do the work. I have people working and they're doing things and I'm also helping on the floor. I'm also taking orders. I'm also fulfilling orders. I don't have enough time 
in my day right now. And this is just one extra worry for me. And one extra thing I have to think about finding the time to do. I actually had to pay an employee to work for me from four o'clock until seven so I could come to this meeting tonight. Because normally I'm on the floor. Normally I'm at the store. And I also talked to a bunch of other business owners downtown who are in the same boat. Or their business computer doesn't do Zoom and they can't get home on time to do it because they have to close. So I think it's also important to basically canvas the downtown, canvas the businesses, not just restaurants, because this affects all businesses. And have a meeting with the city council, councilors, the legislative committee, and business owners, just, just those groups to discuss these things. Everybody has opinions. I'm sure not everybody agrees with me, which is perfectly reasonable, but I think you need to hear both sides and all sides. And now is a terrible time to try to, for business owners to find the time to talk with everybody. And, you know, when we do make appointments, you know, I made appointments with Jim and with uh, Noah and with Naomi and um, Rachel was there. Um, the first meeting I had with Noah, he forgot or he, he thought he had emailed me that he couldn't make it. You know, it's like, wait, you can't do that to a business owner who's going out of their minds right now trying to find an hour to talk to you. I, I just feel like businesses downtown don't have the time right now or the resources right now to actively give you one feedback about this ordinance and two, be able to think clearly about all the problems that it portrays. Lastly, just as an example, I order, I order cups, 60 cases of a thousand at a time because they're biodegradable and I order them special. I have to go through those. That's more than a year of cups. So I do the same thing with other products as well, which are not your recycle, that are not the biodegradable products. But what I do do is every item that we sell that's a plastic has been recycled once or at least already. And we tell our customers to please recycle this. This spoon is recyclable. This cake box is recyclable. Please put this in your recycling. Now, if I have to say to the same customer, this is compostable. You can't put this in your recycling and you can't put this in the trash. You, and you can't put it in your home compostable. What am I supposed to tell them to do with it? There's no option. Um, thank you, Judy. Thank you very much. Um, who else would like to speak in public comment? Amy. By the way, I, Judy, I don't recall if you identified yourself at the beginning. Did you, did you by any chance? Oh, turn off your mute. There I'm you go. Judy, I'm Judy Harrell. I own Harrell's Ice Cream. <laughs> Most of you know me. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Hey, Councilor uh, yes. Can you see the raised hands? Do you want me to tell you what they are? Yeah, because I don't. I'm only seeing people on the screen raise it. I don't. Uh, Have I don't you clicked see your participants on. window? Um, I can. I can tell you when someone finishes whose whose hand is raised. Yeah, if you would, that'd be great. So it's so, it's not Amy. <laughs> Amy. <laughs> it, Amy is next. It's Amy. Then okay. then Eli. Then Kathy Murray have raised hands. Um, virtual raised hands. Okay, so Amy Kaling, you're next. Excellent. I'm uh, Amy Kaling. I'm a Florence resident and I am executive director for the Downtown Northampton Association. And I thought I would start by giving you all a little bit of a background of the um, 
what business looks like downtown and the landscape on which you are asking for these businesses to make these changes. Um, just very high level in Northampton, we have lost 15 businesses that have closed permanently since the start of COVID. Of those 15, five are restaurants. They're gone, they're not coming back. We also have seven additional restaurants that have closed for the winter. My fingers are crossed that those seven will reopen come spring, but there's no guarantee. They've closed to try and make it through until next year. And those are just the ones that I know about. There are a few places that are quiet that I suspect are also struggling with trying to make some of these um, tough decisions about how and whether to hang on until the spring. And so in the face of all of that, and we're now heading into an uncertain winter when we don't know, um, we don't know if any aid is coming from the government. We don't know how willing people will be to continue to get takeout. We don't know what the weather's gonna be like. Um, in the face of all of that, these businesses are facing dramatically decreased um, revenue, many of them upwards of 70% of a loss in revenue and increased costs. Um, they're pivoting to take out curbside for many of these businesses. They never did that before. They're buying products that they've never had to purchase. Um, it's a lot and they have reduced hours, reduced staff, reduced menus, um, reduced or non-existent indoor dining. And in the midst of all of that, I'm trying to encourage them to pay attention and engage with a, um, an ordinance that's gonna require them to yet again, potentially pivot in the way that they're doing and change the materials that they're purchasing. Um, and I think that the end goal of a more environmentally friendly practice for all of our downtown businesses, everybody collectively agrees on. I don't think that there's much dispute around that. The challenge is um, doing it right now in the middle of all of this when there is so much uncertainty going into 2021. Um, even though August of 2021, that I think is the current date that this is to be enacted, um, feels like far away. It, there's so much uncertainty about what will happen between now and then that asking a business to, to plan now for an implementation in August is um, just incredibly challenging and incredibly difficult. Um, and so I'm here to ask that you table or continue or extend or delay the implementation of this to give these businesses a chance to just survive, to just make it to the spring and to be able to get back on their feet and then to address this. Um, the other thing I'd say is that uh, Recycling Works has been great. They've reached out to some businesses and I think it would make this, um, I think Judy said a more informed ordinance. I think having the time to have Recycle Works go and talk to all of our downtown restaurants and those that are most impacted would create an ordinance and with data behind it to really make it an informed, um, an informed ordinance with restaurants and community that was engaged behind it and ready to jump on board. Uh, I think that's all. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Cheryl, who's next? Noah. Noah Cassis. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Noah. I am, I use he and pronouns. I live in Ward 1 in Northampton and I'm calling in today as the chair of the Northampton Youth Commission, which is a city body, which was um, one of the uh, sponsors and crafters of this ordinance. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is just uh, talk for a second about the process that we went through um, to get here. Uh, we started working on this ordinance about uh, 15 months ago now. Um, we spent about uh, eight, um, eight to nine months uh, working on an extensive process of research, looking at what other communities have done talking to environmental experts, as well as people who have worked on these efforts in those other communities and have seen the effects um, after ordinances like this have been uh, enacted. And then we really pivoted pretty hard as soon as we had a basic idea of an ordinance um, this, this fall to, uh, to, once we started introducing, we sent um, to doing business outreach. We created uh, seven, I believe, seven uh, distinct times that we um, invited all the, whole, the entire business community of Northampton and Florence to come meet with us. And we got to talk with some people. Um, and we also got to uh, create some, some other meetings um, that uh, some other meetings that we had a chance to talk with people individually. Um, and we have really appreciated the chance to engage with the community and have um, 
later tonight, we'll be talking about some of the amendments that we're going to be proposing to try to make this ordinance a little bit more of a, um, a little bit more accommodating to the current economic situation, including delaying the implementation date um, by four months as uh, Amy Kaylane and, and the DNA suggested at the last community resources meeting, um, and as well as doing some things to um, fix some uh, issues around um, ADA and, and uh, uh, accommodating folks with disabilities. Um, I'd also like to just mention for a moment, we'll get into those amendments and some of the specifics of why we think that those will make a better ordinance. Um, I'd like to mention for a moment I, uh, that this is an issue uh, that is very urgent to young people in the city and it's very urgent to the Youth Commission because um, this is not just an issue about, well, it is about waste stream and it's about, you know, kind of the classic environmental issues of wildlife and, and you know, ocean habitats and whatnot. It's really about the climate crisis. It's about um, a city which has made a promise to its people and to specifically its young people that it will deal with the climate crisis, that it will actually tackle this issue heads on um, and that it will um, try to prevent the worst effects of catastrophe from, from decades of inaction and fossil fuel consumption. Um, and this is a step towards that. Um, and I think that the Youth Commission and the sponsor of this ordinance have been uh, incredibly forthcoming and we will continue to be so and, and more than we even more than we have been um, as we continue this process to work with the business community and to work with folks who are saying that this is really tough and this is a really difficult moment, which I think everybody understands. Uh, but also that there's urgency on the other end. There's really, there's a hard, there, there's, not, there's not that much time to continue kicking climate issues down the road. Um, and I hope that we can we can all come together and have an, an honest and um, and really important conversation about uh, what what makes sense to what makes sense to do right now, um, and how how we can um, how we can figure out an ordinance which um, meets the urgency of the moment and uh, and is reasonable. And I think the other thing to point out is that um, East Hampton, our neighbor, actually just passed an ordinance which is actually. Uh, less accommodating than ours, less um, less kind of liberal in that way, um, just, just a month ago. So uh, this is a thing that communities are still deciding, making decisions to go forward with, even during this tough time. Yes, doing extra accommodations. Yes, doing extra exemptions. Yes, you know, having longer phase and dates. Um, but I think that, uh, I think that's something really important. I also just want to respond briefly to a couple things that have been proposed by some of the other folks who spoke before me. Um, one thing around canvassing businesses that was actually done pretty extensively, thanks to work by uh, Jim Nash and myself and other members of the Youth Commission, as well as, um, let's see, who else is on this call? Marty Nathan and Rena Pye. Um, we actually uh, dropped off, we, we went and spoke to or dropped off information at, um, I believe, almost all the restaurants in, in downtown. Also working with Amy Kaling, we were able to send a copy of the ordinance and an invitation to uh, talk with us and share concerns to every business in town, um, which we're really glad that some businesses have taken us up on. Um, and also uh, that we have been able to um, to work really closely with experts. And I, I think this is not, I don't think this is an issue of finding a more informed ordinance. Um, I think we've done a lot of work to make sure that it is very informed and that it is um, very much following the model of successful ordinances in other parts of the city. But I do think it's an issue of making sure that we're all really communicating. And I think this, uh, this meeting tonight is one is one part of that. Um, so with that, I'm sure I'll, I'll talk more later about some of the amendments that the Youth Commission and the sponsors, the City Council sponsors, will be proposing. But uh, that's it, and I hope that um, I hope we can all have this conversation and keep in mind both the urgency of the economic crisis and the urgency of the climate crisis. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Eli Sharp. Marlin. Eli, you're up. You're there. You go. Uh, hi, my name is Eli Marlin. Uh, I'm a resident of Northampton. I am the vice chair of the Northampton Youth Commission. Um, and yeah, I'm also talking about the uh, this ordinance, uh, this polystyrene reduction ordinance. Um, Noah hit a lot of the points that I was going to talk about. Um, there's a few things. One, uh, as Noah said, East Hampton recently during COVID passed a more strict version of uh, our ordinance, um, a similar ordinance. Um, other towns around the country have passed similar ordinances. Um, this is not something uh, unique to Northampton. We're trying to jump onto this train because it's a really important issue uh, for everybody um, that needs to be solved on a, a very specific timeline. We don't have forever to solve this. Um, we need to do it as quickly as possible. 
but we definitely understand this is not a normal time that businesses are really struggling. So we have tried very hard to reach out to as many businesses as possible. We've um, talked to businesses. We've had a lot of Zoom sessions. We uh, sent, I think, 150 uh, copies of the ordinance and in invitations to come talk with us to every business that we thought would be affected um, to this. But we understand that that is still, uh, there's still a lot of concerns. Um, as Noah said, again, uh, we're proposing that the date will be, uh, I think January, 2022 uh, is when it would be implemented, um, which is about a year from now, um, which hopefully most of this COVID, um, in this COVID crisis will have been uh, over by then. Um, we're also making amendments as uh, for the ADA, for straws, things like that. Um, and a lot of the alternatives, while they do exist and are more expensive, um, ideally, as time goes on, that price will be um, reduced as consumers move to uh, less of a pattern of single use, just getting something and then throwing it out when they're done or putting it in a compost bin, whatever, um, to a more reusable, bring their own uh, container or cup or something like that, um, which many consumers already do. Um, those are some of the, the big points that I, I thought were important to mention. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Shara, who's next? Kathy Murray. Hi, I'm Kathy Murray and I apologize that my camera's not working. Uh, I that's live in okay. Laurel Park in Northampton. Uh, I'm, I'm a, I think, prospective member of the Disabilities Commission and I work with family caregivers and I understand there's a lot of pros and cons to this to this ordinance, and uh, I just want to ask that when you do consider it, if you do consider it, and I'm happy to hear that um, this consideration has already come up, that you consider excluding plastic bendable straws um, upon request. Um, I work with people uh, with disabilities, with hand and arm limitations, and sometimes plastic straws are the only thing that make it possible for them to get adequate hydration and nutrition. And especially if they're they're out in public with friends, it, it's a very it's a very limiting factor to not be able to have access to that, to be able to eat with your friends, drink with your friends, you know, have have as typical as experience as possible. Um, I know there's alternatives to that, and a lot of people say, you know, it's oh you can have reusable straws, but reusable straws need to be cleaned. Um, people can't necessarily clean the straws. Metal straws can can. Pre um, can pose safety hazards. Um, paper straws can, uh, they get soggy if they're in water for too long or in liquid for too long, can present a choking hazard. And compostable straws can even present an allergy hazard. So really plastic straws are the sort of the gold standard in terms of accessibility. And as I said, I'm really happy to hear that, that that's already being um, thought about and considered. And uh, I hope that that will end up being an exclusion from the, from the ordinance when, when and if it is put into place. Thank you very much. Councilor Shara. Jay Werther. Jay Werther. Hi, uh, Jeremy Werther, uh, one of the owners here at Homestead in uh, downtown. Um, I, I just, I, I've been uh, paying attention to this for quite a while, of course, as soon as things cross our desks, it's definitely something that uh, even in our shortened amount of brain uh, power and brain and, uh, and bandwidth that we find time to pay attention to. Um, I, will, I will state that I am for this ordinance. Uh, I believe that, you know, environmental impact is, is definitely something to um, focus on and pay attention to. You know, we, we use all compostable matter here uh, or, you know, and nothing that needs to be, out of, you know, thrown into the trash, um, at least in terms of our takeout uh, programs, which of course we created for this pandemic. Um, I, what I want to focus on and, and bring to, you know, back to the forefront is some of the uh, questions and issues that have been brought up by some of the people that have spoke before me, uh, primarily Judy's uh, mentioning that if downtown doesn't have a way for us to properly uh, you know, if there's no system here in downtown that allow or, or citywide that allows for, uh, you know, an obvious method of disposal for the uh, compostable matter, then, then, you know, as she put it, we're putting the horse, uh, the carriage before the horse. If there's no way to properly handle this, then that's just one more thing that's going to fall onto the individual business owners 
Um, and you know, hopefully in a month, in, you know, in a year's time, we have the ability to focus on that. But right now, we we don't. Um, I am one of the restaurants that was mentioned by Amy that is currently closed. We do have our fingers crossed very tightly that we'll be able to come back and that this actually becomes an issue for us. Um, but we had other things that we're dealing with uh, before now or before then to to deal with. So. Um, I just, I, I, again, I'm trying to highlight a few things that have been brought to the attention uh, before me, such as how do we, how do we make this work? Um, I do appreciate the timeline that has been extended. Um, and then I, my follow-up question is, if anyone knows, uh, and my comment is, does East Hampton have uh, this citywide method of uh, disposal that we currently don't seem to have? And with that, I leave my, uh, my time. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. <clears throat> um, Judy, I noticed that your hand is up, and I just want to let you know this is a public comment period, so it's not really a point of debate. It's not the it's not a debate. Or the discussion process will come up on when the item comes up on the agenda, and you may have an opportunity then to speak. I just okay. wanted to answer a question that was brought up, actually. Um, um, why don't we save that for the the floor discussion? Okay. Um, is there anyone else who wants to speak in public comment now? Jer Jeremiah has his hand up. Jeremiah, you're up. I'm the owner of uh, Union Station here in Northampton. Um, and I just wanted to talk about this because- Excuse, excuse me, Jeremiah, if you just give us your full name and your, the city where you live, please. Uh, Jeremiah Mecca, I actually live in uh, East Hampton, Mass. Okay, thank you. Yep, so I wanted to talk about this because um, I understand the ordinance and I definitely agree with trying to be uh, pro environment and moving forward. I think there's other ways to do it than um, putting an ordinance that forces us to spend more money. Um, if there was some kind of a tax credit, a citywide tax credit on all of our com compostable uh, items that we are purchasing and some other way that we can get the money back that we actually have to spend on it. I think there's other ways to do it than just saying, hey, business owner, you have one more bill to pay. It's frustrating for us. Obviously, I'm down 70%. I've lost over $2 million this year. And the first time and the only time that anybody's walked through my door since this has started or for the last nine years that I've been open was Jim Nash to talk to me about compostable and plastic use in Northampton. Now, after losing, I don't know, like I said, a few million dollars, laying off over 50 employees, um, on the brink of closing this business, if not for the winter, for good, uh, which I would say is a focal point in Northampton, a 30,000 square foot building. I'm talking about plastics with a committee that hasn't talked to me about how much I've lost, how much people have lost that have worked here, how if they're able to pay their rent, if they're even in a home. And this is a discussion that, yes, needs to happen, but after the pandemic. This is incredibly frustrating and it makes me not want to be part of the Northampton community for much longer. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? No, sure. What's that? Is there, is there anyone else with their hand up? Um, I don't, other than Judy's, I don't see any other hands that are raised. Council Labard, do you want to speak in public comment? You'll have to, you're muted. You're on mute. Can you hear me, Counselor? Okay. Yes. I think um, I just have a couple of things that I'm concerned about, which I have heard already on public comment, but also reading, <clears throat> you have to excuse me, I've got a cold coming on. Reading um, Judith Harrell's email that she sent us, I never knew that when they had to order equipment or anything, they were being charged a COVID fee. And seeing what she was paying, $400, this, this is unbelievable here. Um, I do want to say we heard Kathy Murray speak on the Commission on Disabilities. I had brought forth about the bendable straws which is critical, critical. Please hear me out that people with disabilities should have the right to go into any business to say, I would like a plastic straw. And it's because of 
why they need to have that, why it needs to be bendable. I've worked with people for 35 years with disabilities, two feeding right down the line. And it's critical that we look at this ordinance very, very carefully to make sure we make hopefully an amendment to add on plastic straws as a reasonable accommodation and not to have to go into any business to say, I would like a pass, uh, plastic straw. And they say, well, what your disability is, don't do that because that's a, against the law to do that. I have a lot of concerns right now as a counselor hearing from businesses of it being such a bad time to even bring this forth to city council. Richard Cooper, I've never seen him come with his business before and ask counselors to put this back or Judith Harrell and Amy Caroline and many other businesses that have talked to me. The blue bonnet, Greco right down the line. I think we need to look at what we're hearing from the business people. I think we need, we're looking at this date. We're looking at, should we put a hold on this, table this, wait until what happens with this COVID and then get together again with all the businesses here in the city and come and make a reasonable ordinance. I, I just feel that they are hurting there. I have never seen anything like it as long as I was born and raised in this city with the city of Northampton. It looks terrible down there. I'm talking about businesses. You can tell they're hurting. And I think it's our job as counselors. Yes, I agree about the environment and the climate and plastics. I hate plastics, period. This is not the time to put this right on to all these businesses. And I feel bad for them. I, I, I wish I could do more, but I cannot. And I, I'm just concerned of hearing all these charges that I never knew was happening to restaurant owners. And then we're hearing, well, now that they're not being treated well in the city and not want to feel welcome here. So that's it. That's all I Counselor, have. excuse me. I just want to be clear that, um, and this is for other counselors in attendance here, that you are a deliberator on this issue should it come to the floor. Yes. And so I'm concerned that your uh, public comment actually counts as debate. And I would, I would caution you if, um, uh, just caution you on that point, and and, I and that and that caution holds for the other counselors too. If you're if you're interested in speaking in public comment, consider the fact that you are a deliberator and will have the opportunity to speak to this in full. Okay. Um, this is an opportunity for the public to make their thoughts known and share their thoughts with us. Thank um, you. You're welcome. Uh, Thank you. Rena Potter. Uh, uh, Renna Pye. And then um, Levi Armstrong. All right, Renna. Yes. Hello, I'm Renna Pye. I live in Northampton. And uh, I have had the great pleasure of working with the Youth Commission on this ordinance. And it's great to see everyone here. I'm happy to hear from some business owners that we haven't managed to really intersect with in the past. Uh, although I agree with everything Noah and Eli have said, they did a tremendous job reaching out to people. And we have spent hours talking with many businesses about this. It is so unfortunate that this is happening during the pandemic. We started working on this way before the pandemic was anything uh, we could have imagined. And even then, I remember talking to someone who was around during the time that the smoking ban was implemented in Northampton. And she said, boy, there were some people who were pretty upset about that in the restaurant business, and yet it all worked out. So uh, I don't think we would ever want to go back to those days where we had smoking inside of restaurants. Um, it's a huge problem. It's, it's Yes, the pandemic is creating a dark, dark place for all of us now, but the US is the largest contributor of plastic waste of the entire world. And when you look at the plastic waste that's strewn on the beaches, eight out of 10 of those items are, and not to speak of microplastics, I'm just talking about macro things that you can identify. Eight of those, eight out of 10 of those things are from single use disposable food related products. And those are, it's such an ephemeral use of plastic, which is now driving 
fracked gas because the energy needs are less. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem in so many levels. I know many of you understand that already, and I also understand how difficult a time it is for everybody in the restaurant business and in the world right now. Uh, still, I think we need to realize that with the postponement of this ordinance implementation till January of 22, we are taking that into account that it's a hard time right now. And I hope the growing pains will be uh, softer. softer. <laughs> That's all I want to say. Oh, I guess I want to say one more thing. Specifically, the East Hampton ordinance that just passed uh, does not allow plastic number five or aluminum. And we are allowing both of those things in addition to compostable materials and reusables. Um, so in that sense, it should be easier for us than it is for them. Thank you very much. Oh, who's next? Levi Armstrong. Levi. Hey, You're right. hi there. Uh, just my apologies. My connection is kind of bad. I'm on the greatest Wi-Fi spot, so I had to keep my camera off. Uh, okay. So my name is Levi Armstrong. I live in Ward 6, and um, I am from the Northampton Youth Commission, although I'm not, uh, I don't work with the, excuse me, sustainability working group. However, I just wanted to weigh in that, um, first of all, I, I've been here since the beginning of public comment, and I've heard from all of the business owners, and I just want to say that I, I, I feel really bad for you guys, because I know this is a really hard time. Um, so I feel for you and I, and I empathize with you. However, um, I think that uh, Eli, who spoke a little bit before me, uh, pointed out and um, Rena just did that this ordinance would not be put into place until a year from now. So I'm hoping that since then, um, or, or from then, we'll be out of this muck and um, uh, everyone will have the you know, resources that they needed. And I just wanted to say that also in a lot of the other local businesses, public comment, they said things like, I feel like we understand that the, uh, that the environment is important and, and then, but blah, blah, blah. And I just think it's a little bit ironic that you would point that out and then however, say that you are against this measure. Um, so I just wanted to point that out that you should be, that I just want to say that, I think that this is really important, and as a, a you and as a uh, kid, I think that the and I know that the climate is the number one most important um, issue of our time. There is nothing else debatable about that. Um, about that, what I just said, it is the most important thing, and we have to do every single thing that we can to stop this crisis. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, who's next? Theo Star. Theo, you're up. Um, hi, sorry, my screen also isn't working. I'm Theo Star. I'm just a member of the Youth Commission. I'm in the stand of Sustainability Working Group. And I mean, I'm only in high school and I have no idea what it takes to run a business, clearly. But, and I agree with what Levi said and Rena. And I, I know this is horrible timing but and reconsidering it when COVID is officially over or at least in a better place would be convenient and it seems ridiculous that we're asking this maybe but it's not really new news and it's not it's not like out of nowhere like this should have been in place years ago and there isn't really I think there could be edits made to it to make businesses comfortable and adjust uh, to people with disabilities a little more. Um, but there isn't really, uh, the pandemic is temporary and climate change is not going to disappear. It's, it's not going anywhere. So we can't just keep, and this isn't gonna like change the course um, it's not just going to put an end to it, but it's a step that needs to be made as soon as we can, and we can't just keep putting off. So respectfully, I think that um, there's more things to consider than that. The economic part is giant, but um, this is a very serious issue. So thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? There are no other raised hands right now. Okay. 
All right. Um, so why don't we move into the in, into the regular meeting? Um, and uh, the first item, of course, is the approval of the previous meeting's minutes. So I'll accept a motion on that. Move to approve. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, any discussion on the minutes, changes, modifications? Okay, uh, Laura, please call the roll for the minute approval. Laura, you're muted. Councillor Dwight. You yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, and as I said to, and maybe some folks weren't here for that, but um, we have two smaller items at the end of the agenda that um, given the extent of the debate and discussion that we will be devoting to the main article that's been the topic of conversation in public comment, um, it's a possibility they wouldn't get addressed in a timely fashion. So if you'll bear with us, I would like to move those items up to the top of the agenda and move and vote on those and then we will do the deep dive if everyone's amenable to that on the, on the, on the committee. Is that okay? I've seen nodding heads, so I'll take that as an assent rather than have Laura vote on this. So, okay. So first up is uh, item 20.154. This is an ordinance relative to a stop sign on Edwards Square. And this was referred by the council on I'm sorry, little memos keep popping up and telling me that uh, Joe Biden has been chosen president, if anyone's watching at home. Uh, there we go, got that out of the way. So it's a stop sign, it's, uh, it was uh, referred by the council on December 3rd. Um, and the item is, relative to a stop sign on Edwards Square, um, Section 312-113 is Schedule uh, uh, 12, Stop and Yield Intersections. The location for this is Edwards Square, and the direction of travel is north. It's one-way street, and uh, at the intersection of North Street is a proposed stop sign. So is there a motion to put that on the floor? Uh, move a positive recommendation. Second. Second. Motion has been made in second, and I'm going to give that one to Council Maori. How's that? And then we spread the seconds. Um, so, uh, discussion. I know Wayne Fiden is here to discuss this, and Councilor Nash uh, from Transportation Parking is here as well. Uh, Wayne, do you want to speak to this first? Since sure. I'll, I'll be quick. Yeah, I mean, generally, you know, we have a little street hitting a big street. We don't put a stop sign up because it's pretty obvious that somebody's supposed to stop. Um, but we now have the city's first so-called contraflow bike path. So you can get from North Street onto the bike path at Edwards Square. And so you have a, a road that's one way northbound, but you have a bike lane that's next to it that's two ways northbound and southbound. Um, we think it's safe. There's a low volume of both cars and bicycles. But in abundance of caution, we just think it's important to put the stop sign up where Edward Square hits North Street, just given you have more turning movements and, and vehicles. Uh, Council Shara. Um, so Wayne, am I reading this right that this is a change and there had been a stop sign, but it was on the King side, even though that was going in the wrong direction? I, there wasn't a stop. I don't know what the ordinance said, so I can't answer that, but there was not a stop sign there. Oh, it, it just has, it has direction of travel west crossed out and changed to north and the intersection King Street crossed out and changed to north, which is why it sounds like it's a change from the opposite direction, which wouldn't make any sense. Uh, perhaps Nash, Council right Nash has an answer so. to that. Yes, yeah, so the, um, so this is a, a change, but it's not a change of the, there was a stop sign at some point on King Street. It's not there right now. And when, uh, and when DPW was looking at uh, installing, you know, putting the stop sign in, they noticed that the stop sign was on King Street and they wanted to actually install it over on, uh, on North Street. So rather than just 
creating a whole new ordinance. It looks like we're just switching it from one end of the street to the other. But actually that this is, this is shouldn't needs to be considered as a new stop sign. Um, I sent some photos to Laura. I don't know, if, Laura, do you have any, were you able to come up with a, did you get those? You're muted, Laura. Um, what, did you send it right before the meeting or yeah, I earlier? It. I didn't I get it. I can look at my inbox. I diagram for this, so. Um, I mean, it's, it's just a minor, I, I was just curious because it's a one-way street, so a stop sign at King wouldn't make sense. So presumably maybe there was a stop sign there before it was changed to a one-way. I, I was more curious than concerned. <laughs> well, I, I would just like to add it onto what, what Wayne has been saying is that the reason for the stop sign, I, I had a discussion with Director Lascalia earlier, is that the traffic counts on North Street do not quite meet the warrant. But if you have a chance, uh, I'll, I'll send the photos uh, to. I do have them now. Do you want me to try to screen share? There's yeah, that three. Would be I don't know. I can only one at a time. What you'll see is that the travel lanes are actually quite confusing as the, as the bike lanes intersect with the travel lanes for the cars. So that, um, so this is, Yes, so there's the scene as you're coming down Edwards Square. So the thought is that having the, the, ex, having the, the stop signs there is, is causing everybody to just think twice as they are approaching this unusual confluence of bike lane and, and, um, and vehicle lane. Can I just point out the obvious that there are stop, stop signs, signs in these pictures? Are those photoshopped? No, <laughs> we're actually already there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, we, okay. we did install them as part of the bike path construction. The issue would be if somebody didn't stop, could we issue, can we give a citation? Got, Got it. it. Um, I have one question in the, how is this impacted by the proposed uh, redesign of King Street near that intersection? Um. It shouldn't be. I mean, DPW is looking at both. That's, you guys accepted that street. That's why we're doing some additional, DPW is doing some additional work rebuilding that retaining wall. Um, but it shouldn't create conflicts there. Uh, any other questions? No, I was just going to comment that, you know, I, I don't think it was there. It was a crosswalk, but a bicyclist was just uh, hit on King Street. So I'm glad to see um, the stop signs being officially ordained there. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? If not, uh, Laura, would you please call the roll for a positive recommendation to the council, please? Sure. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Mayori? Yes. And Councilor Thorpe? Yes. All right. Thank you. That passes. Um, item 20.155, this is an ordinance relative to parking on Middle Street. And this was referred by the council on the 3rd of December as well. And this is um, a point 40 feet easterly of Maple Street. Uh, this would create a parking prohibition. And um, I'll accept a motion to put it on the floor. We have a positive recommendation. Is there a second? Second. Okay, okay, second by Council Maori. Um, so uh, is this not <clears throat> the parking prohibition that we had already discussed? Council Nash? No, it's not. This is oh. at the other end of, of the street up where it meets Maple. Um, it, it is part of a um, uh, so Councillor Jarrett had a discussion with Director Lascalia, and they examined a few different features around the parking on that street. This has to do, uh, up near Maple, the turning radius for uh, trucks and vehicles was not enough. Uh, so that uh, by eliminating some parking spaces up at that end, um, that made for a safe turning. And um, 
I'd also like to recognize that my colleague from the TPC, uh, Karen, Karen Foster, is also in the meeting and could speak to this just as well as me. Um, maybe next time we'll do that. <laughs> Thanks, Councilor Nash. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Councilor Foster, I did not want to ignore you, but uh, uh, Councilor Nash has established himself as a de facto member of the Legislative Matters Committee. And, uh, and he he uh, spoke to it very well, better than I would have. I'm, no, I'm sure. Councilor Garrett apologizes for not being here today. Um, he had some other obligation, and so that's why I am speaking in his stead. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments on this uh, parking prohibition on Middle Street to allow for wider turns by larger vehicles. If not, uh, Laura, please call the roll for a positive recommendation. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. All right. That passes now to now to the main event. Um, so, as I said, I, I think what I'm going to do is on this, I'm going to read the whole ordinance. Now, this may sound like a punishment to people, um, particularly as I mangle various chemical names and the like, but uh, it's worth knowing because I heard a number of comments that actually didn't actually acknowledge what's actually standing in the ordinance now as proposed. Um, and then also then after which we will introduce or discuss amendments. There, um, I am anticipating a, a presentation from uh, the part of the sponsor groups, which is uh, from Marty Nathan, Rena Pai, Noah Cassis, uh, Eli, I don't know if you're gonna be speaking, but there will be some conversation relative to that. Also available, we uh, depending on the recognition by the committee that um, we will hear from uh, Keith. Keith, is it Benoit or Benoit? Uh, Benoit. <laughs> Benoit, it is. Uh, Keith Benoit, uh, uh, representing the Disabilities Commission, and then also other business owners and, and the like that we've heard from, but maybe if uh, depending on the pleasure of the committee would have an opportunity to speak more expansively on some questions. So, all right, brace yourselves. Here it comes. Uh, the, um, what I will be doing is I'll be reading it on my phone. <laughs> so my apologies, but you, uh, Laura has it up on the screen so you can read along at home. And this is upon the recommendation of the Mayor's Youth Commission, Council William H. Dwight and Council Rachel Mayori. Um, and I'm going to skip the boilerplate, and we're talking about removing section 272-18, which uh, is currently now, and in replacing it with section 272-18 uh, titled Environmental Protection and Solid Waste Reduction. A, first off, general definitions as used in the ordinance, the following terms shall have the meanings indicated. ASTM standard, standards developed by the American Society for Testing and Materials, including only international standards, D6400 uh, or D6868 for biodegradable and compostable plastics. D6400 is the specification for plastics design, uh, designed for compostability in municipal or industrial aerobic composting facilities. And D6868 is the specification for aerobic compostability of plastics used as coatings on compostable substrate. The term biodegradable entirely made means entirely made of organic materials such as wood, paper, bagasse, or cellulose, or bioplastics that meet the American Society for Testing and Materials, uh, D7081, standard for biodegradable plastics in the marine environment or any other standard that may be developed by the American Society for Testing and uh, Materials specifically for the aquatic environment. BPI certified is the term. The means refers to compostable products and packaging certified as compostable according to the Biodegradable Products Institute. Compostable. 
Disposable food service ware or packaging is compostable if it meets ASTM standards for compostability and is BPI certified. The term disposable food service ware means all containers, bowls, plates, trays, cartons, cups, lids, straws, stirs, forks, spoons, knives, and other items. One, designed for one-time or non-durable uses, or two, in which any food vendor directly places or packages prepared foods, or three, which are used to consume foods. Such food service ware includes, but not limited to, service ware for takeout food and or leftovers from partially consumed meals prepared at a food establishment. A food establishment. It's an operation that stores, prepares, packages, serves, vends, or otherwise provides food for human consumption. As further defined in 105 CMR 590, any establishment requiring a permit to operate in accordance with the state food code 105 CMR 590 and as follows, shall be uh, considered a food establishment for purposes of this ordinance. A medical care facility. It's an establishment in which people receive physical or medical treatment or care as further defined in 521 CMR 13.01. Polystyrene. The term polystyrene refers to a synthetic plastic polymer used to make food containers, cups, packaging materials, utensils, among other products. It is commonly known and referred to as plastic number six. Polyethylene. The term polyethylene refers to synthetic plastic polymer used to make grocery bags, shampoo bottles, and other containers, among other products. It is commonly known and referred to as plastics number two and number four. And for the purposes of this legislation, both plastics number two and number four should be considered polystyrene, uh, polyethylene, I'm sorry. Uh, polyethylene terephthalate, <laughs> there it is. Uh, the term polyethylene terephthalate, also known as PET, is a common po uh, plastic polymer widely used in making uh, to make packaging for foods, beverages such as soft drinks, juices, and water, among prod among other products. It is commonly known and referred to as plastic number one. Polyvinyl chloride. The term polyvinyl chloride, also known as PVC refers to synthetic plastic polymer used to make plastic straws and utensils, among other products. It is commonly known and referred to as plastic number three. And <clears throat> polystyrene loose fill packaging. A void filling packaging, a void filling, that's the hyphenated word, packaging product made of expanded polystyrene that is used as packaging fill, commonly known as packing peanuts. Prepared food. Prepared food means any food or beverage prepared by the food establishment at any location owned or controlled by the food establishment using any cooking or food preparation technique. Prepared food does not include any raw uncooked meat, fish, or eggs unless provided for consumption without further food preparation. Prepared food may be eaten either on or off the premises. Recyclable. Material that can be sorted, cleansed, and reconstituted by Northampton's year-round municipal recycling collection programs for the purpose of using the, <clears throat> the altered form in the manufacture of a new product. Recycling does not include thermally destroying or converting solid waste. Retail establishment. Any commercial facility that sells goods directly to the consumer, including but not limited to grocery stores, pharmacies, liquor stores, convenience stores, restaurants, retail stores, and vendors selling clothes, food, and personal items, and dry clean services. Reusable, products that are designed to be used more than once in the same form <clears throat> by a food or retail establishment. Biodegradable bags, bags that one, contain no polymers derived from the uh, fossil fuels, and two, are intended for single use and will decompose in a natural setting to an environmentally beneficial material at a rate comparable to other biogradable, biogradable materials such as leaves and food waste. Reusable bags. Bags that are not made of plastic are for multiple use and are made of cloth, fabric, or other durable materials that do not decompose into harmful chemical components. A reusable bag is 
recyclable, biodegradable, or compostable, and is specifically designed and manufactured for multiple reuse. Compostable bags, bags that one, conform to the current ASTM B6400 standard for compostability, and two, are certified and labeled as meeting the ASTM B6400 standard specification by <clears throat> a recognized verification entity. Recyclable paper bag, paper bags that one are 100% 100% uh, recyclable, including the handles, and two, contains at least 40% post-consumer recycled paper content, and three, display the words recyclable and made from 40% post-consumer recycled content or other applicable amount is in a visible manner on the outside of the bag. Product bag, bags <clears throat> without handles in which loose produce bulk items, unwrapped baked goods or prepared food or other products are used, <clears throat> usually placed by the consumer to deliver such items to the point of sale or checkout area of the store. These are sometimes used by the cashier or checkout personnel to contain items of, at point of sale. Checkout bag, carry out bags previously provided by a, uh, by a store to a customer at the point of sale. Checkout bags are, a distinct, are distinct from product bags. Okay. Now this is the general prohibition and regulation as defined. Number one, food establishments are prohibited from providing prepared food to customers using polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride, polyethylene and poly, <clears throat> polyethylene terephthalate or other recyclable disposable food service ware. Two, food establishments using any disposable food service ware shall use biodegradable, compostable, reusable or recyclable food service ware. All compostable food service ware are <clears throat> used by food establishments must be clearly labeled with the applicable standard on the product of its packaging. Number three, retail establishments are prohibited from selling or distributing polystyrene food service ware to customers. This includes the sale of polystyrene ware for home uh, food use. Four, Retail establishments are prohibited from selling or distributing polystyrene loose fill packaging to customers. Five, retail and food establishments may only sell or distribute brought, uh, product bags, which are either one, biodegradable, two, compostable, or three, reusable. All compostable product bags uh, used by retail and food establishments must clearly be labeled with the applicable standard on the bag. Six, any retail establishment provides a uh, that provides a checkout bag to customers, the bag shall be either a recyclable paper bag or a reusable bag. And now the exemptions. One, the mayor's designee may exempt a food or retail establishment from the requirements of this ordinance for a period of up to six months. Upon a finding by the mayor's designee that the requirements of this ordinance will cause undue hardship to the establishment. The mayor's designee may approve one additional six month period upon showing of continued undue hardship for medical care facilities seeking temporary exemption due to uh, uh, due to undue hardship. The mayor's designee shall grant an exemption for one year with an opportunity to extend the exemption for an additional one year period. An undue hardship shall only be found in a circumstances or situations unique to the particular food or retail establishment such that <clears throat> there are no reasonable alternatives to plastic products or materials banned in this ordinance that are necessary to the establishment's operations. Or B, circumstances or situations unique to the food or retail establishment such that compliance with the re uh, requirements of this ordinance would deprive a person of a legally protected right. C, Circumstances where a food or retail establishment requires additional time in order to draw down an existing inventory of plastic products or materials banned in this ordinance. Any food or retail establishment receiving an exemption shall file with the mayor's designee monthly reports on inventory and remaining stocks. Two, any food or retail establishment seeking an exemption shall apply to the mayor's designee using uh, forms provided by the health department 
and allow the mayor's designee or his or her designee to access to access uh, all information supporting its application. Three, the mayor's designee may approve the exemption request in whole or in part with or without conditions. Four, the mayor's designee by regulation may establish a fee for exception, uh, exception requests. Five, certain products are exempt from this product's prohibitions. These include A, flexible transparent covering, commonly referred to as plastic wrap. B, thin film plastic bags used to contain dry cleaning or newspapers, typically without handles. And uh, B1, product bags are not exempt from this ordinance prohibitions. C, uh, packaging utilizing for prescription drugs. Now we're up to the penalties and enforcement. One, the mayor's designee shall provide to food and retail establishments succinct materials explaining the requirements of this ordinance and recommendation for proper waste stream procedure. Two, if it is determined that a violation of this ordinance has occurred, the mayor's designee shall issue a warrant uh, notice for the initial violation. Three, if an additional violation of this ordinance has occurred within one year after a warning notice has been issued for the initial violation, the mayor's designee shall issue a notice of violation and shall impose a penalty against the food or retail establishment. Four, each penalty of this ordinance clauses shall be no less than one, $50 for the first offense, two, $100 for the second and all subsequent offenses. Payment shall be made within 21 days to the city clerk. Non-payment of such fines may be enforced through civil action in the Northampton District Court. No more than one penalty shall be imposed upon a food or retail establishment within a seven calendar day period. Five, there is no five. Severability. If any provision or section of this ordinance shall be held to be invalid, then such provision or section shall be considered separately and apart from the remaining provisions of sections of this ordinance, which shall remain in full force and effect. The effective date, the ordinance will take place on August 1st, 2021. Uh, is there a motion to put this on the floor for discussion? So moved. Or second. 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 Okay. All right. What's the committee's pleasure? How would you like to proceed? Would you like a presentation and discussion? I know that there, as you heard in the public comment, there was uh, made mention um, some possible amendments being proposed. Um, what, what's your pleasure? Council Chair. Um, since I know that there was extensive discussion in community resources, I'd love to hear what amendments they're proposing um, since that they've already done that work. I think it would make sense to, to hear those proposals. Yeah, I, I agree with Councilor Shiara. I think it would address some of the concerns that have been brought up if we went over the amendments. Okay. Uh, uh, who would like to represent those uh, proposed amendments? Uh, Keith, or Keith, you, uh, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Keith Benoit. I'm the community development planner with the city, and I'm the staff person with the disability commission. Um, so maybe like you, um, you know, how um, uh, someone with disabilities might react to this. This has been an education for me. Uh, so they've been very gracious to. Um, you know, tell me their experience, and then I've done my own research, um, but which kind of led us to our two um, exemptions. And basically, uh, anyone uh, that requests a plastic straw, uh, if this were to move forward, should be granted a plastic bendable straw uh, without any discussion into a disability or trying to prove. Um, and then the same exemption will be allowed for plastic bags. Um, I had sent a letter um, to the councilors uh, regarding this. Um, there's a lot of concerns with um, non-plastic straws. If you go to, say, a reusable straw, if you have to uh, bring your own, um, people with mobility challenges, um, if they have tremors, glass, uh, Pyrex, plastic, um, these things can injure people because um, they don't bend. 
Um, so if you imagine you're, you know, you can't control yourself and you're trying to uh, move to the small object, that would cause some real damage. Um, glass can break um, and reusable straws have to be washed. So you're asking someone who's disabled to have to do this, you know, this fine motor control to wash this thing. Um, and uh, not only that, it's quality of life. So if you're going out, you have to remember, oh, do I have my straw? Um, so it's another additional consideration. So, um, you know, it can make, you know, being spur of the moment, you know, kind of a little more harder to just, oh, I'm gonna go uh, meet my friend. You gotta think about, oh, I do have my straw. Um, and so if you have um, a caregiver or someone who's helping you, that's an additional thing um, that, that they had to consider. Um, but, you know, you can think about transportation time. Uh, maybe they getting a milkshake or a coffee or something and they're bringing it back to their house or to their work. Um, their travel time is going to be a little longer, you know, possibly. So that straw is going to have more time to degrade. Um, and if it, if it was um, uh, uh, compostable. Um, so there's just uh, different concerns with that. And then the plastic bags as well. Um, you know, they, they offer handles. Um, they're more sturdy over time. Paper can uh, degrade if it gets wet. And again, you're thinking they might have longer commute times uh, getting in a van or getting special transportation. Um, and then the plastic bags have loops that they can tie down either on a wheelchair or their walker um, or, or tie it down so things do not um, kind of fall out. Um, I think there, there might be a, a few more points in there, but uh, I think the, the bottom line is, you know, disability, um, people, concerns with people with disabilities is, is not just those, but just the quality of life and being equal with everyone else in the community. So, you know, there shouldn't be any uh, shame or, or trying to ask for an exemption. This should just, anyone who asks um, for a plastic bag or a straw should be granted. And, you know, it doesn't matter if the disability is visible or not. It's not, it's not for anyone to, to make a judgment of, on someone's disability. Uh, Dr. Sarah. Um, Keith, excuse my ignorance on this question, but what is what are the current requirements to provide straws to be ADA compliant? Do, do restaurants have to currently provide a straw or, or like a bendable straw versus a straight straw um, if someone requests one? I actually didn't uh, research that. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I can get back to you on that. Okay, or I don't know if anyone else can answer it who, um, who's researched this. Thank uh, Marty has your hand up. Marty, you're on mute though. I there cannot you know. answer that question. My question to Keith is, um, and we've talked before, uh, is about the bags. We, uh, we already have a plastic bag ban um, in Northampton, and there are not exemptions in that for, um, for people who have disabilities. And, and ha have people been reporting that they have problems? Because it seems, unlike the, the, pla the straw thing, it seems like there are alternatives that folks uh, can bring reusable bags uh, or use, I, 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 I hear what you're saying about paper bags uh, being rippable and that kind of stuff, but there's reusable bags and people have, we've had the other bag ban in, plastic bag bin for quite a long time. And uh, I have not heard that there are complaints about that. <laughs> Okay, let, let's try and do this in sort of a. Sorry, if I, sort I, I was no, out of. That's fine. That's fine. You're fine. Um, in, in point of fact, actually, we did consult with the uh, Disabilities Commission before the uh, bag ban. Actually, um, this this came up, although to Keith's point about universality, 
that that the challenges are equal to everyone across the board, whereas the straws, I think, as you point out, Marty, are distinctive there they're, and, and probably, and that would be the main point of, of discussion as far as that goes. I think Noah, did you, uh, Noah, if you're willing to talk to this, I think one yeah. of the amendments you were considering uh, relative to the straws, or were you, what were you guys talking about? Yeah, well, actually, I don't know. Would I be able to, so this is actually, I'm glad that Keith brought it up. Uh, we received, first of all, we heard from uh, Marianne at some of the community resources meetings, uh, rightfully reminding us of this issue. And we very much thank you for that, Marianne. And then also suggesting that the Disability Commission uh, take it up. And we found their letter very helpful um, and really um, we use um, their, their thinking about straws to craft an amendment, um, which we'd like to uh, introduce now, if that's okay. And I don't know, Bill, if it would be possible, um, I, could, um, I could share my screen if, I, if that's something that I can do as a non-host. And then I think uh, Rachel, um, who is a co-sponsor of the ordinance and will be presenting the amendment, could then read in the amendment and then we could talk about it and answer any questions or anything like that. Does that sound right. okay? Uh, just, yeah, that sounds okay. But just, bef just before you do that, I just want to actually clarify for everyone. Um, the only people who are capable of making amendment proposals are members of this committee. So that's, as, as Noah said, that Rachel will probably be presenting this uh, amendment. So just before everyone starts getting excited about their own amendments and want to put them on, you can recommend them, you can suggest it, but it will require uh, a, a, a first, a motion and a second by the committee. So Noah, proceed with Great. your your language. And, and, and I'm just trying to... Oh. Sorry, if it's though, possible, you want, you want to do a screen right. share, but also um, or is when... Or end up counselor? Oh, I just, yeah, I made on. Noah a co-host. I think that gives him the ability yeah, to he, screen you share. you should be able to, yeah. Noah. Right. Yeah, I just okay. saw that. Thank you so much, Laura. Yep, I can. Okay, okay. great. Hang, hang on a sec. So sure. what I want you to do is to, uh, when we cobble the final language on this, forward it to Laura so that she can oh. introduce it into the, uh, into the document as written. Yes, I will As do so. On okay. I can send it to her. We have these all in Google Docs, so I can send her the Google Doc in the in the chat. I think I can do that. Um, all right. Very good. So let Although me start with it's... this, or I can email to her. That's also fine. Well, um, it's all it's all subject to a vote. So just mind you, we haven't gotten that far, but should and course. it may be changed. But thank you for please present your original proposal. Okay, that sounds good. So I'll share this, and then uh, this is an amendment that. The Youth Commission, which is one of the sponsors, obviously not a council member, has worked with uh, Councillor Mayori to to write up. And I think, well, Councillor Mayori, you can read in the amendment and then we can kind of show where it fits into the ordinance and talk about what the specifics are. Um, all right. So that's a copy of the ordinance. And here is the amendment um, that we will be proposing around straws. So I'm just going to read it. Um... Let's see. The sponsors move that the plastic reduction and sustainability ordinance is amended as follows. Number one, by adding the following as a seventh item in section B. No retail or food establishment shall sell or distribute straws made of polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride, polyethylene, polyethylene paraphernalia, excuse me, uh, retail, re <clears throat> Retail and food establish establishments may sell or distribute compostable, biodegradable, and reusable straws upon request by the consumer. Upon request of a plastic straw, retail and food establishments may sell or distribute polypropylene uh, straws. Retail and food establishments are encouraged to offer compostable or reusable straws. Two, by adding the following as a new definition titled polypropylene directly after definition of polyvinyl chloride, polypropylene, the term polypropylene, also known as PP, refers to a synthetic plastic polymer used to make food containers, disposable diapers, disposable cutlery, and plastic straws, among other products. It is commonly known and referred to as plastic number five. So I Great. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so that is the amendment as it stands um, right now. And let me just explain a little bit of our thinking around this. And I might ask Rena to hop in here too. Um, so the first thing that we took a look at was 
Um, after we received the Disability Commission's letter, um, we saw, you know, very clearly them on behalf of, um, as, as a group advocating for people with disabilities in the city of Northampton, requesting that there uh, is an ability, you know, without need to prove that you have a disability, without need to specifically be exempted because you have a disability, to be able to access bendable plastic straws. Um, and so we started taking a look into, um, into bendable plastic straws, and it turns out that um, bendable plastic straws are all made of polypropylene. Um, or practically all of them. There are some um, polystyrene straws, but actually those have not really been in, in use very much because, uh, Renny, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that they've been found to be toxic and you don't necessarily want to be putting them in your mouth that much. Uh, so the straws that we think of as, as bendable plastic straws are polypropylene. Um, and so we wrote this amendment to clarify that we do want businesses to be able to um, upon request and not upon proving an, you know, a disability or anything like that, uh, be able to sell and distribute polypropylene straws. And then since we introduced polypropylene into the mix um, as, a, as a term, we also are adding a definition there. So that's all from me. I don't know if Rena wanted to add anything to that. No, I think, I think you've covered it, Noah. Oh, and I'll just add one more thing, which is that this very closely mimics the language that, um, that the East Hampton uh, ordinance contains after their own research and consultation with with disability advocates around um, this issue. Uh, so yeah, I think we could, I don't know, Bill, obviously you're the chair, so you uh, decide what we want to do, but we could take questions if people have them. Well, uh, let's open the floor to questions and discussion on, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Council Miori, was yours a proposal, was yours a motion? for an amendment? Yes, it's, um, yes, a motion. Okay. To Approve the, the amendment. Okay. Is there a Offer second? The amendment. Something like that. Second. There's a second. Okay. Now we can discuss. Um, so the amendment is on the floor. That is the focus of our conversation right now, discussing the uh, the classic straw exemption. Are there any questions or com comments? Oh, come on. Somebody's got to say something. Uh, Councilor Shara. I mean, I guess my, my question would be for Keith, whether Keith feels that that, um, that covers what the request was from the Disability Commission. Yeah, it, it looks like it does. Um, let us see it and to get a little more clear language on the definition of the, the plastic. Yeah. Um, I, I'm reading a law review article on the possible conflict of straw bands and plastic bands uh, as it relates to ADA. Um, right now, it, it just in my cursory regard, it simply says that outright bands, which this is not, would certainly run afoul of the ADA laws. But other than that, um, making accommodations and exemptions would qualify. Uh, we also, just for the record, and if anyone's curious with the city solicitor is here, there he is, yeah. If, if you have any questions also to direct to him. Um, that was my and, history reading of the same law article. <laughs> right, and, they, and, and the severability clause essentially identifies in the course of this that if it does turn out that it is uh, runs counter to standing federal and state law that they this uh, that section would have no validity it would be disqualified just so everyone remembers that um, so what we're going to do is we're going to discuss these amendments as they come and then vote on them as they come um, so any further discussion on the straws uh, 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 well Okay, uh, Councillor Nash, and I want to be careful, the same caveat holds here is that you will be a deliberator on the council floor, but um, do you have some input or some questions relative to the straw issue? Also, you're speaking as a, a, a former disability commissioner, as I recall, so. I have too many hats. Yeah. So, um, I, I just want to make sure, uh, Councillor uh, Foster is th in the room, and she uh, specifically spoke to this during community resources um, that uh, that 
you know, that I, I think that the wording here uh, matches what she was uh, uh, highlighting that, uh, that people not be, need to identify themselves as disabled in order to uh, get a plastic straw. And um, the, the only thing that we're, and, and I think this already exists, um, is that um, businesses may offer a plastic straw right now. We're, there's, I don't think there's a law saying they shall offer a plastic straw. So that I, I think we're, we're staying in keeping with that. Um, so I, I think this is matching what, what we were we were looking for, and I'm going to defer to Councillor Foster here if Councillor Dwight wants to recognize Absolutely. her. Absolutely. Yeah, Council, Councillor Foster, uh, what do you have for us? Thanks, Councillor Nash and Councillor Dwight. Um, sorry, my puppy is chewing my dishwasher. Um, oh, that's I, <laughs> OK, there. Um, yes, that language does meet um, my point when I um, was with the Disability Commission that I think is, is so important is that piece of not having to identify as having a disability um, just because that that can create to or lead to that culture that can be so ableist. Um, but if upon request a plastic straw is available um, is the language that, that made sense to me. And, and um, from reading the letter from the Disability Commission, um, it seems to be in the spirit of their ask as well. Yeah. It's, it's worth noting that that is actually one of the cornerstones of ADA law is um, providing dignity and not exclusivity and, and promoting the issue of ableism. So um, that, that is the heart of the, it's why uh, most access ramps and things like that must be at the front door, not some back service entrance and things like that. Uh, Noah, you had a comment you want to, you want to, well, I actually, I have a question and then a comment, actually. The first thing, I guess this is both to Keith and Karen. And so I think this follows up on that last thing, which is something that we were thinking about as we were writing this amendment over the last few weeks was, um, you know, I think it was very clear from everybody and totally makes sense based on the dignity question and also just based on, you know, people having, um, people having rights uh, is not asking somebody to disclose, not asking somebody to prove, um, and just having it be a universal basis. My question though was actually whether it should go further because here's, here's my question. We have it as it is right now, it's upon request. I do wonder that leaves open possibly, uh, I mean, obviously we didn't decide to move on this, so I'm not sure about this, but it leaves open a possibility that a business could still you know, ask somebody to, right. to demonstrate something. Um, so I don't know if that's something we have to, I don't know if that's something, it's probably not something to legislate, maybe it is, but it also may just be something to be clear about as a community and, and as we're doing education about this ordinance, which is like, you shouldn't, like, if you're a business owner, you really shouldn't ask somebody. That also could, maybe it's already covered by ADA. So I guess that's my question is, does this go, does it go far enough in protecting that? I, I may answer that because okay. actually ADA law applies to all restaurant owners okay. and all business owners and all community members and businesses. And so it therefore is incumbent upon them to understand and appreciate the law okay. or suffer the consequences. But your point of education is very important. And I think that's that would be a critical aspect. It, it's, it's not generally known perhaps by many people. There's so much to know and try and know what regulations are. And I think in the process as we go forward, if we go forward, that um, that be uh, an integral part of the discussion when we when we go before businesses explaining to them, particularly this element about the plastic straws. So Yeah. And I'd like to, I'm sorry, I just add one comment uh, onto this, which is that this actually, we didn't mention this, and this is obviously not the main point of this uh, amendment, but one thing that was brought up by uh, Judy Harrell, um, and as well as when we've spoken to like Lime Red, um, has been the issue of boba straws. I just want to clarify: uh, this will um, this will cover this will cover you know boba straws will be available on re upon request uh, according to this ordinance because boba straws are, as far as I could tell, all boba straws that I could find were made of polypropylene, as I think are basically all other straws. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, Um, uh, committee members, uh, well, uh, Judy, you have your hand up. Do you want to, you want to, you're mute right now. I, you I have to leave the meeting in a couple of minutes and get back to work. Okay.
But okay. I, I know this is out of order and I, I apologize for that, but I wanted to bring up two quick things. A lot of the businesses in East Hampton regarding the ordinance are actually filing for waivers because they can't do it. There's no alternative available. For example, Mount Tom's, who's an ice cream store just like us, they have exactly the same problems as we do. I spoke with Jim Ingram about it as requested. Also, uh, as far as reusable containers being brought from home by customers in stores, in a lot of situations that is against FDA regulation um, the ordinance that you want to look at is 3-304-17, 18, well, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, all the way down to 30. Um, some, in, under certain circumstances, it's okay, but under most circumstances, it's not because of E. coli and other bacterias and also porous materials versus non-porous materials. And lastly, it's a problem with a restaurant's insurance companies. If a restaurant refills a customer's container and the customer becomes sick, it's not covered by your insurance. So that's a big problem for, and also in our case, we're kosher. I can't take a customer's item and sanitize it in my kitchen because I have a kosher kitchen. And if their item wasn't kosher, I can't bring it into our kitchen. And I have no evidence of it. So I mean, for me and for us at Harold's, and I know that, um, you know, Rich has the same problem with somebody that eats something and then they want to refill on the container. That's not allowed by the FDA or serve safe. That, that's it. I just wanted to let you know those answers. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, if it's any Consolation. I'm. I'm actually very aware of those laws and standards. Right. So I knew. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. Um, uh, so more on to the back to the amendment. We do have to talk to this amendment and keep the point. But I've been Judy. I, I allowed you that because I understand your time constraints. But um, so to the amendment. Any other discussion relative to what is being proposed now on polypropylene straws? Council Labarge has her. I know I am acknowledging Council Labarge uh, to the amendment. What would you like to say? Yes, I would like to say that I would like added on to this amendment, which I have brought up at the Commission on Disabilities, everything about the plastic straws. And Keith will verify that. Of the need of that plastic straw is extremely detrimental for people with disabilities. I'm just curious if we could add the language, Noah, and the sponsors about to ensure that the language of reasonable accommodations is in that ordinance. And I think that's valuable there, reasonable. Um, and that's through the ADA, it, it, correct, Keith? Isn't that, Keith? Reasonable yeah, that, accommodations. That, valuable it's and we could include that however as you point out it is redundant it's already established under ada law i understand it's, that concept so, it's very important that we put that language in there this is what you call educating mm -hmm. that's all i have to say counselor okay thank you you're welcome um, um i'm sorry can i respond to that for a sec so, yes you uh if, counselor barge if you wouldn't mind do you have a um do you have a a recommendation of a specific place. I can share my screen again. Do you want to recommend where? I'm I'm not sure where you'd want us to include that. Would you want to do a well, new both, sentence? Both Keith and I could look at that very carefully and add that in because we have talked about that at our Commission on Disabilities. And even with um, Councillor Foster, the dignity and respect part was brought up by our commission along with Karen. There's mm -hmm. a lot of value here. So Keith, maybe you, you and I can look at this along with Noah and the sponsors, please. Um, just to be clear, we yeah. that we're, we're, we're drafting a law. So yeah. as far, which is separate from the education. I think the education is a built-in and they understood. I understand that. But in the language we, so if you wanna, the problem is 
<laughs> what I would recommend is that we proceed with this amendment and our vote recommending it either yay or nay. And if you have any modifications that you want to propose, if it, get, if it survives and gets to the council floor, that you would introduce it there. And that would probably be the best way to proceed. Otherwise, we're going to get continually get bogged up here and we'll, we'll all die of old age before we actually get very far with this. I'd rather die so, of old age and get it over with. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, we're, uh, you know, to your point, it's, and I want to emphasize again, that is an implicit and understood aspect of, of uh, dimension of the ADA law that you know, all reasonable accommodations must be made. And then, of course, you have the flexible perception of what counts as reasonable or unreasonable. We have this conversation on other points, but you it's perfectly fine to include it. But right now, absent that language and a place to put it, I would recommend that if this amendment survives and then further that the ordinance survives with the recommendation of the council, that whatever you and Keith have you can introduce as an amendment to the amendment on the council floor why can't if, it be done now councillor because you haven't recommended a place where you would like to put it in the, well, in the, in the amendment. having lower put it back on the screen and we can place it there if possible if possible because no uh, one just asked us to take a look at it if you put it up on the screen and what we would like to add, correct, Noah? I think what Councillor Dwight might be concerned about is just that we have three to four to maybe five other amendments to discuss. Uh, so maybe what makes sense, I mean, I, I'm obviously, I'm not in charge of what we do next, uh, but Councillor Barge, maybe uh, what could happen is if, if it does move on past uh, this meeting tonight, past the Legislative Matters Committee, uh, we could set up a meeting um, with myself and yourself and Keith and uh, hammer it out. And we could do that before it gets to the floor and then make that amendment as one of the first things once it comes up for, um, for debate on the city council floor. I think that just might uh, make it easier for us to get through other amendments and uh, get to the conversation that a bunch of um, businesses are, are here to talk about as well. But I don't know, that's my thinking. Um. Actually, more importantly, is there a member of the committee uh, prepared to make an amendment to the amendment or modification of the language of the, um, as it stands? All right, seeing none, um, we'll proceed that way. So uh, uh, any other discussion on the amendment? Uh, Laura, would you call a roll call on the amendment? please. Oh, you're muted. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. That's the First Amendment. Well done. All right. We're on our way. We're getting there. Um, next up, what, uh, well, why don't we go to the big bugaboo, the one that we heard the most from, uh, this is implementation date for uh, effective date. I know I'm leapfrogging all over the all over the ordinance, but um, given I'm trying to pick out the marquee points first. Um, I know that uh, Noah, you and Rena and Eli and Marty, among others, and and Council Miori have discussed a possible. Uh, proposal for changing the date. And in fact, Eli brought it up in the course of public comment. So what do you got? I, we have a little amendment here and I'm gonna pass it off. Does Rachel wanna read it? Sure. The sponsors move that the plastic reduction and sustainability ordinance is amended by striking out the date of uh, 0801-2021 in section F and replacing it with the date 0101-2022. Is that a motion? Council? Motion, yeah. Second. There's, there's a, yeah. And there's a second, okay. Let's discuss. Uh, comments, questions? Uh, Council Thorpe. Thank you, um, I, I appreciate all the work everyone has put into this and the extension 
um, you know, greatly appreciated. My only concern is that if you're a restaurant or of any business owner, you're able to survive the winter months and keep going, the extension might work. If you're a business owner and you're closed until April or May and you open, you're gonna probably be using the supplies you have on hand and the four month extension may not be enough time. That is my only concern. Thank you. Um, I, I, let, I'll speak to this first and then, and then Noah and Marty or whomever. Uh, you'll notice that actually there is a clause in here that allows for exhaustion of existing um, inventory before. Right. Uh, so so and that, that is part of under the exemption clause. So that there is an accommodation for that. But um, uh, let's see. I don't, Rich. I don't know. You just queued in, and do you have a you have a point you want to make about that? You're on mute, though. There you go. No, I'll just I'll just reiterate that I think that you know putting this off for um, a year is not time enough for um, the market to. Uh, regain its posture pre-COVID. But can, can you expand on the pressures that um, that would present to you? Um, well, fine. Uh, I, I personally don't think that we, we are going to find alternatives to the packaging that we're using. I don't think that there are um, compostable materials that are translucent enough that we can package up our baked goods, our sandwiches, um, some of the other aspects of the, um, of the ordinance, the, the plastic bags, you know, the produce bags. Um, I don't understand how, um, you know, we're going to bag up our lettuce and our broccoli for, for retail. We can't do it like a supermarket where they have, you know, giant bins of, of broccoli out and that are being misted and people just, you know, Fortunately, pick through them with their hands to find the one they want. We package everything, you know, just put it into a bag so a person can grab a bag of broccoli or a bag of lettuce. Um, I don't know what the alternative is for that. Um, I don't know what the alternative is for our, our deli bags. You know, you buy, you know, a half pound of turkey and we put it into a, um, a Ziploc bag. Um, the same with a sandwich. Um, the, uh, the part that uh, we're not allowed to sell things means that we can't sell solo cups. We can't sell disposable nice forks and spoons for somebody wanting to, you know, a picnic at La Park. Um, so I just, it feels like there's, that the, um, the supply marketplace hasn't caught up to with what we're trying to do here. Um, as, as Judy said, it's, it's putting the cart before the horse. Uh, Council Chair. Um, Rich, is there, particularly for the packaging that you were talking about, is there a reason why you wouldn't feel you could apply for one of the exemptions that are listed? If there's not an alternative for what you, you need? Um, well, I, just philosophically, I hate to be an exemption. <laughs> you know, I want to, you know, uh, as a business or as a citizen, I want to comply with everything and I don't want to have, you know, a special exemption for one. Uh, the other I think is that the exemption has a um, expiration date on it, isn't it? Yeah, so there are up to, uh, there's, as it's currently written, there would be up to two six month exemptions that could be granted, yeah. Yeah, again, I, I don't think that that's, um, I, I don't think that the marketplace is going to catch up. I don't think there's going to be uh, packaging that will suit our and our customers' needs um, within a year, if that's what the case is, or or two years, if this you know is postponed till next January, and then I get two six months exemptions, providing that they're granted. I, you know, I just don't know what what we would do. I think we would stop selling a lot of these things. Marty, do you have something? I mean, yeah, remember, we're the, talking to the deadline. Yeah, for the produce bags, there are options. Uh, they may be more expensive. 
I do not know. Um, they are clear, and I think that you could use them, Rich. I'm not obviously uh, grocer, so um, I'm only guessing here, but they use them out at River Valley. Um, and I think that we're talking about, we had just this kind of thing where the suppliers really aren't together uh, in mind when talking about putting it off for a year from January and adding the two six month exemptions. It would be two years. Um, and so, and it does two things. First of all, it's just fine if you're an exemption. It is not a blot on your reputation. And I think <laughs> we all should recognize that. You know, we, we uh, one thing that's be, uh, that I'm afraid I'm, I'm, is being lost here is how much we love and want to work with you. Okay. This is, we also, hate climate change. And so we're caught here, all of us, everybody here is caught between a rock and a hard place. And we know that. Um, I'm sorry, that was an editorial comment, <laughs> Bill. I know I wasn't supposed to put that in here. Um, but I think that we are talking about two years. Um, if you think it should be longer, then you could suggest that. But um, it by making this ordinance, we are going to make people who can do it, businesses who can do it, do these changes. And that will make a difference. That's really important in this world. And it's going to be happening all over the country at the same time that we're doing this. I will shut up. Um, let's see. Uh, Mr. Werther, you're, you're You've been patient and have had an opportunity to speak. So if you give us a shot. Appreciate you hearing me. And I wanted to speak specifically to the timeline that's being proposed and amended here. Excellent. Excellent. You know, as a, as again, a business owner in downtown who is, is all for this change. Um, I do have concern along with my you know fellow business owners about timeline and, and feasibility. Um, I wonder if it's possible to, and you know, pardon my name, uh, naivete on how these proceedings and, and processes go. Um, but is there a way to very similar to some state legislature that has been uh, passed since the beginning of the pandemic? Is there a way to put into uh, writing that, um, you know, maybe this ordinance can go into effect, uh, you know, let's say for lack of a better term, eight to 12 months following the lifting of the state of emergency that is currently on in Massachusetts very similar to the way that our liquor licenses have been expanded upon uh, on the restaurant level. Um, that gives the opportunity to both pass the, the legislation um, while also giving businesses um, you know, an opportunity to, to refine our footing because I think that is also being semi lost on a lot of uh, discussion here in that the pandemic's gonna go away, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully very soon, um, but businesses are not gonna come back on the snap of a finger it's going to take some time for us to refine our footing, regain significant, significant losses, uh, very similar to the gentleman at, at Union Station, we're close to a million dollars in revenue down this year. So um, just an opportunity to regain footing and, and maybe a way to find a uh, quote unquote middle ground with the date there. Um, just an idea. And maybe someone can answer my better understanding of how this goes. Oh, thank you. Actually, you're you're spot on. In fact, uh, Councilor Nash had, uh, had sent a, an email with somewhat similar language that essentially tying in the start update with um, the lifting of uh, emergency response orders from the city and from the state, um, and also worth discussing. You did nothing inappropriate. You were. You did exactly what I had hoped. So, uh, Noah, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. So, uh, Mr. Werther there, <laughs> um, uh, your first name, I meant. Um, yeah, that was something that we talked about. And it was actually even before, uh, I guess it's it's good ideas keep on coming up. Even before Councillor Nash brought it up, it was something like when it was just me, you know, Rachel, Rena, and Eli in, you know, in a Zoom room this summer, it was something we were talking about. Um, now, I do think um, uh, Attorney Seawald is on the call, so I might 
ask him to chime in here. We, we worked with him a little bit over the summer to, to sort out some legal issues and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that we brought this idea up and he wasn't wild about it. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, Attorney Seawald. Um, but I think that the, the issue, well, one of which was that it was very it was very uncertain and it wasn't sure whether the emergency order would be more tied to health concerns or economic concerns. Um, but I think the other thing that kind of, and I think the thing that we kind of settled on there um, was that if we chose a timeline which seemed reasonably long, um, that would also give the city council uh, time to amend it. Like if it gets to, it, we don't have to wait this long, but even if it was November, you know, if it was December 1st, of next year and it just wasn't we just weren't ready the city council could very reasonably amend it by delaying it four months obviously that's no uh guarantee and i understand that's not as certain of a you know kind of um adaptability as what you were proposing but i think that was kind of what we came to but obviously we should discuss this idea and uh, attorney seawald uh, correct me if i was wrong about how i characterized any of our conversations Good evening, everybody. Um, I believe what we talked about was that it would be best to have a date certain. Uh, I'm not saying that you couldn't peg this to the some period after the end of the declaration of emergency, either by our local board of health or by uh, the governor. Uh, but it's certainly um, preferable to have a date certain. You're saying it's it's preferable to have a date certain because we're crafting a law that actually has to have a reference date from point of right. Uh, and so, start. you know, and and someone reading this law will know whether it's January first, twenty twenty two, or not. And uh, someone reading this law might not actually know whether the governor has lifted the emergency order or not. So it's just certainly clearer and more definitive if there's a date certain. And that was my suggestion. But I'm not saying and I'm, there's no legal prohibition against tying it to the end of the uh, state of emergency. The, um, actually, Noah brings up another point is that we do have the power to amend and adapt as, as conditions and circumstances present themselves. And in fact, actually delay implementation should it come to that. Um, that's not ideal, but we're not living in ideal times, obviously with I ideal conditions, but um, you know, the, the, the critical feature of this conversation, you know, you it basically uh, I'll editorialize a little bit here is that uh, Essentially, all political issues are essentially a conflict of competing interests, not not bad behavior or anything else. It's just there we have we have here uh, competing interests, whereas everyone's singing the same tune in this in this uh, at the same tone about the critical element, uh, the critical aspect of the uh, climate crisis and what and, and the, you know, not only business, uh, the threatening business existence, but all of our existence or life as we know it. And so when we have these debates and discussions, they're not, these are not just, you know, this is not whimsy. This is not just a feel good proposal. This is not designed to uh, just say, look how hip Northampton is. This literally is driven and motivated by a, a, a genuine sense of urgency and crisis. That said, it is not obviating or ignoring, nor even shrugging off the 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 horrible pressures that are being realized by many of the local businesses. As Amy pointed out, the the census of businesses is diminishing every day, um, and and he and the fact is is here's a proposal. That just uh, adds to the well, adds to the aggravating circumstances. It is not, although I don't think it is the thing that destroys the businesses. But the fact is, the businesses, the restaurants, and everything else, and the and the grocery stores, and everyone else who's experiencing pressures right now, they can't argue with COVID, and you can't argue with uh, you. You can't say. 
customers come into my store, you can't require that. You can't ask the, the only point at which you can speak to is when a municipal government proposes one smaller aspect that of influence that would have an impact. And that's as it should be, as far as it goes, when we make law, it should be, we should be here to give this due consideration and weigh it in the, in the balance. That was a really crumbly way of presenting what I was trying to say, but I, I, I think that, you know, the amorphous issue of the timeline. Now it's quite true. I, I believe I, I believe that um, the pressures that exist are the fact that on the supply side, you have absolutely no idea what's coming down the pike. Or if 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 uh, if there's a a wave of uh, you know if we start implementing aspects of the Green New Deal, that suddenly federal government starts requiring making these same restrictions. The state is already discussing and considering similar and even further uh, restrictions that would impact these very same businesses. But presumably that's the tipping point for suppliers to go, oh, well, maybe we better come up with some products that we can offer. Although the fact is, is that the, the sponsors have worked very hard to try and identify um, the a number of alternatives and it is understood, this came up during the plastic bag discussion as well, that uh, the alternatives usually are more expensive and, and less options available and present their own problems as well. So, and so all of this is understood, all this conversation has been had also to our not very robust recycling uh, facilities here in the city of Northampton, which is actually my, Marty and Rena have been fighting for that for some time for expanded uh, composting systems, among other things. But we have to speak to the timeline. Um, and if, if we um, accept the amendment as it stands, as it's been presented, then that as has been pointed out with the exemptions provides a two year bumper and room for um, adjustments and accommodations. And if those are not forthcoming, I think we have to commit ourselves as a council to review this and try to find a way that is workable. We, I, I think it is, at least I'll speak for me, but I'm pretty sure this is true of Council Maori as well that, uh, and the Youth Commission. We want this to work. We don't want this to be a lodestone. We don't want this to crush businesses. We want this to work. We want to realize the benefits of reducing these plastics and particularly the fossil fuel production of these systems. So um, Amy had her hand up, but I, I wanna go to Council Sher because she's a committee member. So she she takes precedent here. Um, back just still to the timeline, but about the exemptions. Um, the medical care facilities are can have a two year, a one year and then an additional year exemption. Could someone yeah. just walk me through a little bit about the thinking about why they're granted sort of double the time for an exemption versus a, a, another business? I think the thinking um, initially was, well, I will say first of all, uh, no, I won't say first of all, the thinking is that we're in the middle of a pandemic and that um, while it's pressing to protect uh, everybody's livelihoods um, and everybody's businesses, medical care facilities are very literally uh, saving the lives of people who are being infected with COVID. And so the idea was just like, it's not, you know, uh, I think that there was an, an additional impetus to not provide a burden to, you know, say, even though Cooley Dickinson is almost completely in compliance, um, some of the uh, nursing homes are not. And there was an additional impetus as this summer, you know, we had Massachusetts had the highest rate of nursing of elder deaths in nursing homes across the country. There was an additional impetus to not force uh, nursing homes to find a new product at a quicker timeline. And that was also at a moment when we didn't really know when a vaccine was coming. So I think it's something that, you know, could be if, if we wanted to bring them in line with each other and not have a differentiation, it's something that'd be more reasonable to think about now that we have this vaccine timeline. But when we drafted it over the summer, it seemed like a reasonable uh, additional accommodation to give. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kathy has not spoken yet, 
and Kathy Kay. So you want to, you have, and remember you're on mute. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my name is Catherine Kay and I also live in Florence and um, I'm married to Rich Cooper. So that's the perspective that I have coming into this discussion. I wanted to, on the issue of uh, the effective date, um, I wanted to um, just take you back to something that Rich said in his remarks, which had to do with not moving forward at all with this particular proposal, but because of all of the reasons that you've heard uh, many times now, and instead, uh, we're instead approving a different ordinance that would um, designate whatever city department or commission or 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 subgroup um, is the appropriate one to work on this issue of of uh, limiting plastic waste in the city of Northampton. Work directly with businesses to plan, identify, plan, and implement voluntary, um, uh, voluntary reduction in the use of plastic products that have been designated in this ordinance. And at, after we've done that, you may be able then with that knowledge to craft a more uh, tailored ordinance in terms of any kind of ban uh, that would be necessary at that point. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, I, I think uh, any extension of the effective date of this ordinance is a good thing for the businesses that are affected. And at the same time, I don't think it's sufficient. Um, I think that trying to craft an ordinance right now for something that's gonna take effect a year from now or what in whatever length of time we're um, proposing is not using the best information that we'll have at that time. I think that right now, we don't know what new products will be out there, what suppliers will have available a year from now or two years from now. Why not take the time we have to investigate those options and work very uh, target um, very specifically and work very deliberately with uh, the businesses who are affected most by this to craft the kinds of plans that will reduce waste voluntarily. And then when things have settled down in terms of the supply chain, in terms of the pressures of the pandemic, then take a look at, do we need a, a, a ban? And if so, what does it look like? And as you pointed out, Councillor Dwight, there will be, um, there's, there's state, you know, state action on this that's possible. There's possibly federal action on this. Those are the, the that's the kind of action that is going to cause manufacturers and suppliers to make the changes that then will allow us to comply with these kinds of um, these kinds of limitations, so I encourage you to not move forward with this ordinance as it's as it as it is, and um, if you are moving forward, absolutely um, move the the effective date as far out as as you possibly can, um, but uh, continue to work with uh, affected businesses to to make uh, the changes that we are able to make right now. The other, one other thing I'd like to speak to, the issue of the exemptions. I know, I know Rich talked about this a, a little bit ago, but exemptions are not, um, they're, they're discretionary. So while, you know, you might feel confident about someone who's going to rule on that issue now, there's no guarantee that a business would qualify, would be granted an exemption, either an initial exemption or an extension. It's completely discretionary for the businesses. There is a shell in there for the medical um, piece. I don't know if that makes it different, but not for the, not for just the regular businesses. And it could come with a fee um, and it may not be renewed. And there, I mean, there are, there are requirements to show 
to get an exemption. So it's not automatic that anything, as it, as it should be, you know, an exemption, you should have to show something, right? But, um, but I point that out, you know, someone who applies may not actually get the exemption. Um, and similarly, the counselors who are, who, uh, you know, who are working on this now may not be the counselors here, um, you know, two years from now. So, uh, so again, um, I don't think we can necessarily count on anything um, in, in the future. Thank you. That, that is unfortunately the nature of uh, legislative bodies and law that um, the other, and I, I'd like to point out that actually the council in various iterations has been um, discussing this actually, one of the things, the big things that prompted the conversation was the closing of the landfill and was the redu reducing our waste stream. And the, this started with plastic bag ban as Rich will recall, was originally a styrofoam ban that was being proposed. And in fact, with Rich's input that, that uh, the sponsors, uh, Councillor Adams and Councillor Specter, both not here anymore, um, decided to change it to a plastic bag ban. Again, the Youth Commission was instrumental in, in the development of that. Those youth commissioners are now graduated from college and have jobs. Um, and, and so that the fact is, is that um, Circumstances on the ground will always change. We cannot possibly anticipate every contingency, but at the same time, it does not beg inaction. And I think um, that is the concern here. Um, to do nothing, to, to not start the process, and by the way, this is still a process, um, would, at least in, in my feeling, would be, would be the wrong way to go. Amy, you have your hand up. And then, and then Council okay. Maori, I'm sorry. Go ahead, I wanted Amy. to piggyback a little bit off of what Jeremy had suggested, tying this um, implementation to the end of the state of emergency. And I'm wondering actually if the city council can tie, um, tie its deliberation and its consideration of this ordinance to the end of the state of emergency, which would enable the ordinance when it was enacted and debated <laughs> to be after this period of COVID and to have a date certain when it's implemented. Alan, I'm sorry, I have no power yeah, to this, recognize you, but. That's, that's okay, I would have done the same. So Alan, what do you got? Uh, that's not really possible. The, uh, this current uh, council cannot bind a future council to do anything. And so, as we've already pointed out, this council may not be the next council. So no, there's no way to, to force a future council to do anything. I guess I didn't. I didn't intend for it necessarily to be um, a, a something you're binding the future council to, but um, a friendly suggestion that perhaps the appropriate time to debate this ordinance and and its implementation is after the state of emergency has ended. And that doesn't mean that we're doing nothing now. I think even in the past three months or at COVID time, I don't know how long Jim Nash and I have been talking about this, but. I think that there have been things that have been done with recycling works. And I think that those conversations can continue to happen and change can continue to be made, but the actual implementation of an ordinance that's gonna have punitive costs, um, you know, purchasing costs, actual tangible costs on our downtown businesses can be after the state of emergency. I feel like there's a bit of a disconnect between the conversations we're having tonight and the crisis that's happening downtown. Like I, um, this feels a little bit um, just crazy to me that we're having this sort of conversation when the situation is so incredibly dire downtown. And I, and one last thing and then I'll stop, but it's, we're debating this ordinance that impacts restaurants directly in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of dinner service. And if you're wondering why a lot of restaurants aren't, aren't here, that's why. Thanks. Council LaBarge, you've you, bad agenda. Thank you, thank you. My fingers were getting tired. Um, I wanna thank Councilor Gina Louise Shera. I had the same concerns that she brought up about medical versus retail and, and restaurant owners. Why one, one year, one, uh, um, two years, and then it extended another year. So I was happy to hear Noah come out and say that 
they could look at making some amendments on that. I think that should be equally. And I have great concerns, again, of hearing Amy Caroline tonight about our businesses here in the city of Northampton. Great concerns of what is happening. And I'm a little happy to see the extension from January 10th to 2022, but have to agree with Amy. Things are not good in the city of Northampton. And I, I really have to do a lot of thinking about this. Thank you. Uh, no, you want, well, actually, Councilor Mayor, you had your hand up? Yeah, I just met, um, Amy touched upon this, but I, I just wanted to make it known that um, Recycling Works is prepared to help businesses with this transition. And part of what I think of with the date, the definitive date is we need the lead time to prepare. And if you have a date that's moving or if we wait until supplies are there, there won't be, there'll be then a, another lag for prep time. Um, and also just to mention that why we didn't make um, uh, some of these exemptions, the exemptions permanent is precisely because of the supply chain. We could, if you can permanently opt out and then the supply chain offers viable uh, compostables in, you know, in a year, uh, then, then there's a disconnect there. So that just, just, just to explain that reasoning. Thank you. Um, let's see, Eli and then Noah. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, to echo what was said uh, earlier and has been said several times tonight about um, the uh, about just bringing this up later. Um, this ordinance has taken about 15 months to now and it is definitely not nearly passed yet um, to write. And the climate crisis is not like centuries or even decades, maybe a decade down the line. This is like a finite date problem. This won't just keep waiting. Um, and I think there's an extreme urgency um, that we just need to keep in mind um, with not only with the climate change issue. Obviously, there is economic issues um, that are extremely important um, here, too. But there's this urgency for what the whole purpose of this ordinance is to, to reduce fossil fuels and increase the sustainability of Northampton. Also, um, what Rachel was saying about Recycle Works um, helping out businesses. Uh, we've had them, I think, I don't know if they've actually come, uh, but they've definitely talked with a couple of businesses about uh, them helping out there. Uh, Council Mayor, you, yeah. yeah, I just forgot to mention something that I wanted to mention, which is I heard um, I, Rich Cooper also mentioned this about um, the timing right now, and Amy was talking about this 5 p.m. meeting. So uh, I would like as a committee members, and I'm new, so I, I'm not sure of the process, but we could discuss um, delaying bringing this to full council, depending on what happens, until after the holidays, at least, so that um, businesses would be a little less burdened and be able to participate more fully. Uh, Noah. Yeah, I guess um, just a couple things off of this. First of which is what Rachel said. That is something we've been talking about, and I think something that makes a lot of sense. Um, just to give, you know, just to give a little bit more capacity. I think the other thing, something that Amy mentioned. Um, yeah, I know that the counselors, I know that all the counselors um, are not particularly excited about repeating, uh, you know, midnight uh, council meetings as they, um, as they experienced over the summer. But I do wonder, obviously, no authority to, to, to do anything about this, but I, I do wonder whether it might be possible um, to find a time for uh, either a city council when it gets, if it gets to full council or another legislative matters meeting, if it takes another legislative matters meeting, that would be uh, more accessible for more businesses. Um, so that's that's definitely a, an interesting idea. And thank you for bringing that up, Amy. The other thing I just wanted to say about timing, I think there's a couple things here. The first thing is January, I think this kind of gets to what Alan was saying, although not for the reasons and more for kind of practical reasons. Um, January 1st, 2022 is a date. We know when it is. It is 365 plus what? 15 days away, 380 days away. Um, the issue with tying it to the end of the emergency as I see it is that we really have no clue when that could be. Like, yes, it could be a year or more away, but given how Governor Baker wants to kind of get the economy restarted, uh, if we tie it to the statewide, it could be in six months. And then we could end up finding ourselves in a place where it could go into effect sooner or at the same exact time. So that doesn't seem like a particularly um, good solution to me. 
um, it seems to me like if the decision becomes that we just, we do need more time, maybe a good decision is to do a little bit more time or to have a, an expectation, a, you know, commitment, obviously it can't be a legal commitment as Alan said, but an expectation that the council will review, will, will re can, you know, readdress it in, I don't know, June, July, August, um, and think about the timing and whether it still makes sense and whether it needs an amendment. Um, I think the other thing is about pushing the whole discussion down the line, a similar thing to what I was just saying, which is we can hope that the world's gonna go back to normal in the next year or two. I find that very hard to believe. I think we are getting to, not to be too dire, I think we're getting to a point in the history of the 21st century where things are not gonna be quiet for a while. I think we know from the climate crisis, I think we know from the ongoing um, you know, kind of assault on democracy that stability may be something that doesn't exist quite as much as we like, as we've, as we've had it exist and you know, appreciated it existing over the last decades. Um, and so we could find ourselves in a place where we delay it for a year and a half, and then we get to a place where it's much more difficult to have the conversation and it takes much longer to get to the same point that we're at here. Um, so it seems to me, I mean, obviously I'm a sponsor of this ordinance or the Youth Commission is a sponsor of this ordinance, so I'm gonna land down here that the thing that makes the most sense is to create an adaptable um, and reasonable ordinance now, and then to amend and to change the timing if we have to, rather than to push the conversation. Although I definitely understand uh, the point from Amy about at least having the conversation, um, you know, this time around at times when it's more accessible to more business owners. Uh, so that's my two cents. And to Alan's point and to that point, um, this council has, as of the first Monday in January, has one year to go on its term. That's it. Um, I know I, for one, know I will not be here on the on the next go around after that. Um, so there will be uh, there will be more than a cosmetic change on the council to be sure. That allows uh, citizens and business owners who feel that this council is not serving their needs, is working at cross purposes for the benefits of the community to actually vote us out of office. Now, despite evidence to the contrary on the federal side, elections are how we go about and decide um, where our priorities should be and how they should be affected. And um, so that actually does give, there is kind of in that a built-in opportunity for the community to express one way or the other, whether they will elect people who will continue to support this and go beyond. But we, as Alan pointed out, we cannot charge a future council body to do what, you know, we can't say, in a year and a half, you must do this in order to affect this law. So, <clears throat> um, and, and that's probably a good thing. I think that's that's appropriate. It's so um, the timeline actually, oddly enough, does have some bearing on that on on that. So actually, attaching it to the. I, I, I would feel comfortable if we live with the date that we've got and with the understanding that either this council, based on uh, uh, conditions on the ground, makes modifications and alters the date uh, in response, or a future council, maybe a more preferable council, um, uh, can also render a decision or actually, depending on how it shakes out, could even eliminate it. But say that this is, um, this is an ill-conceived, uh, ill-inspired plan. Um, so that's my two cents on the, on the timeline issue. Um, other counselors, Councilor Thorpe, uh, did you want to speak to this? I know there's I, yeah. I was just, I was just uh, playing around with my hands here, and I appreciate what you're <laughs> and uh, it, it, you know, we, we could amend this. The council could, you know, make an amendment on the floor, and um, I just wanted to make it uh, noted that my only concern still is with the um, extension and the time for these businesses 
to come into compliance during a pandemic. And I appreciate all you said earlier, and I appreciate what Councillor Sierra said earlier about the um, extension and you know maybe having that extended out to the same timeline as uh, the hospitals have. But that's my only concern. I'm supportive of this, but I wanna make sure that the businesses have enough time and that they're able to um, get on board with this. So that's all, thank you. Councilor Shah. Um, Councilor Dwight, the two cents that you just added right before, was that referring to the timeline as amended, which is on the floor right now, or as written uh, in there? I was, I, was, I was speaking to the amendment. Okay. That's what I was saying. Yes, I, 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 I'm in favor of the amendment. Got it. As am I. Councilor Nash. I just want to say I've been biting my tongue on my amendment the whole time. Thank you. <laughs> almost made it. Nash, you almost that, made it. <laughs> just so close. I think there may be a natural, a natural moment to bring that up um, because I think that will also uh, tie. Wait. Yes, that that will tie into one of the other things which we're going to talk about, but. Um, and Amy, I, I do want to address the, the point about the disconnect. Um, I think you know better than most, actually, to the extent that uh, the, the amount of outreach and work and, and, and thought that's gone into the discussions and consideration of the businesses. Um, and um, I'm actually, I'm COVID retired from a, a restaurant business here in Northampton. I'm out of a job because of COVID and I'm very good friends with the people who own the place. And I have, uh, and you know, I've been in retail businesses. I've been a retail business worker in the city of Northampton. Basically that's my career. I'm no longer employed. Um, I'm pretty cognizant of the pressures that, that are being experienced by business owners, uh, particularly now. I know the distinct and real and genuine pain that's being inflicted. And as I pointed out, I mean, I want us to separate those because the, there are so many other huge pressures that we actually have no control over that we can't help or enhance. We are adding to it clearly. This adds an additional pressure. It is not, in my mind, the pressure that ends all pressures. It's not, it's not the equivalent of COVID. It's not the equivalent of high rents. It's not the equivalent of, of online competition and everything else, but it is tough. But the fact is, is that in this case, unlike those other systems, which are opportunistic um, adventures, this is actually motivated by something that is not disconnected. Um, the, the climate crisis. And, and in fact, actually another very, COVID exists because of the climate crisis. It's, I mean, it's part of COVID was allowed to propagate and, and develop because of climate change. So I, I, I it's, we're, this is, and none of this is being taken lightly, despite the fact that I'm being flipped and I apologize. But the fact is, is that um, we're not going to be insensitive and not intending to be insensitive to the needs and pressures that the restaurant owners are experiencing or other retail businesses in Northampton. They, however, are not exclusive to people experiencing um, the breadth and depth of pain. And, um, and I understand when we started going in, when we actually, when we first started talking about this, it was smooth sailing up until COVID presented itself. And in fact, I discussed with my co-sponsors the fact that this is a really unfortunate case of time. It really is. There's not, but the fact is, is that the way, as you understand, as we, as we generate and create law, it has been, well, it's been over a year now. And actually, as I said, to be realistic, it's been all over six years that we've been having these conversations going on with the same objective in mind. And 
to stop it now, I think in some sense would give some people a sense of a sigh of a relief that that's, uh, that's one bad thing that's postponed. One thing that's going to make my business, at least I don't have to suffer that. I now have to suffer the fact that there's going to be a redesign downtown and or they're going to change the way the parking exists or my rent's going up or my employees are in, in jeopardy and my, and my supply chain is terrible. But the fact is, is that the, our, the challenge before us has not changed. The urgency, I, Eli's made a great point. There is one date certain, pretty much. There is a tipping point at which we are running headlong to without any, I mean, we, we have paid in this community, we have paid lip service to this notion for a long time without really doing much about it. Now, it's, the fact is we're not going to claim change climate change here in the city of Northampton as part of the frustration. We whatever we do is not going to count for much, but it's cumulative. It's other communities, Greenfield, East Hampton, uh, other surrounding communities in the state, all within the eastern side of the state as well, that have also signed on to this. That cumulative effect actually has hopefully benefits. And I know that everyone who's spoken for the business representatives all agree with this as a, a, that level of urgency. And I understand the competing urgency that is their existence as business owners, the people they employ, the things that they work and cherish to create a, a, a system of value to the community. I All of that stuff I'm keenly aware of, which is why we're, we're, we sit here and have these meetings to struggle and try and find a way that we can reconcile at least in some way and offset some of the pain and agony. At the same time, with a prescribed set of conditions and rules established under the Commonwealth law and under the, our, our council charter and under the charter of the city of Northampton, there are those limitations. So I just want you to know that I, I understand the frustration and I apologize that I'm partially responsible for that frustration, um, but, and it is not but I do not do this with malice in any way. And uh, Amy, you can speak back to that because I address that directly to you. It'll be very short because I don't want to drag the meeting out longer than we have to, but I would just, I appreciate the comments and I would just say that there are a wealth of steps that can be taken in between doing nothing and passing an ordinance mandating certain behaviors that are going to cause businesses to incur costs. And I think we surely could find a lot of steps along those spectrum to do before we take the final step of an ordinance. So I'm not suggesting that we do nothing and I don't think any of the businesses would go along with that. I think we can do plenty of things and just put off that final ordinance step until the world is a little more settled at least in terms of our downtown. Otherwise, I think you're gonna be enacting an ordinance and there's gonna be no restaurants to abide by it. Um, Amy, can I ask you this? And, and actually, I would, uh, Rich and Kathy and Jeremy as well, if you want. Um, it's my understanding that pretty much all the businesses on a voluntary basis have worked to comply with this based on their their moral ethos or customer demand and the such. And in fact, actually, a lot of Northampton actually complies with many dimensions of this already. Um, and... And you have suggested that, that that is something we could possibly rely on. But um, I, how, how can we rely on that beyond what we're experiencing now? Uh, if, if I might I jump in. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Jer Jeremy, go ahead. You first. You I jump in as I did have this kind of thought as Amy was talking about you know, possible other uh, you know, avenues between here and there. Um, I'm sure this would require rewriting a lot of what we've talked about tonight uh, or scrapping it and kind of going a different direction. But would there be opportunity or possibility of creating, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on a word here, but essentially a, uh, uh, a refund or a rebate to businesses that do abide by certain uh, guidelines, uh, you know, a, a percentage off of city tax rate or something along those lines. And it may not be, I'm just wondering if that's an opportunity to no, I, incentivize. Well, I, I, 
I'm sorry, I can speak to that directly. No, we, we don't have that authority to do that. We don't, um, the state determines what um, tax breaks are available and and we take full advantage of whatever does come up. <laughs> and also to be mindful, we take full advantage of anyone, any additional taxes that we can add. So, but that we also take full advantage of, of, of uh, tax forgiveness and that we would not be able to um, create a law that would allow that. So that's that's how we're limited by the Commonwealth on that. Well, I, I, I don't mean to, I, I completely understand that and I really quickly thought that was probably the reality, but I don't know if we're talking specifically about taxes here. There's other um, fees and such that we inquire, in, you know, we, we end up having to pay out throughout the year. Are there ways to have them balance one or the other? You know, it, you know again, something as simple as, uh, the, uh, a, a licensing fee for, you know, our, our food license or, um, you know, a, 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 a rebate to be able to get an entertainment license because we're limiting the use of, of plastics or, or, or of the such. Or, or again, just to, to put this idea out there, is there something, you know, a give and take opportunity here? Right. So, Alan, um, can you address the carrot versus stick and, and what we're allowed to do under... Uh municipal law? Well, for local fees that we set, I suppose we could figure out a, a staggered way of setting fees. Uh, anything that's set by the state are set by the state. Um, essentially, though, what is being asked is that the taxpayers of Northampton fund the difference in cost of, of, of uh, you know the the supplies there, the restaurants and other establishments are currently using, and the ones that would be required under the ordinance. So that's essentially what it, what's being asked. And I haven't looked at this, um, but um, I'm there's probably a way to do it, but I haven't looked at that possibility. I've never had a fee schedule. I've never seen a fee schedule that uh, uh, tries to promote or uh, entice certain conduct. Uh, I've never seen that. I mean, the, the fact is fees are established and have to reflect the cost of implementation and enforcement. So any reduction that was offered would mean, seem to suggest that there was, that cost could be discounted and, and was not uh, decided fairly or justly. Unless we can show that, that what we're promoting and what the establishments are doing or saving this the city some of the funds that we are the costs that we are um, that you know we are recovering through the fee schedule right okay that I, I, that makes sense um so it, it's problematic even in, in that we're, we're fairly limited as to what we can offer as incentives yeah um usually usually when we are when we're able to offer incentives it's through some type of zoning um, forgiveness, for instance, your reduction in parking requirements, or so on and so forth. Um, it wouldn't. It, it, uh, it certainly wouldn't help any existing business for the most part as it stands now. I, although you know, I think that's a great idea, and I and but it, it's not something. It, it's not something that actually, when we thought about something like this for a different another ordinance years and years and years ago we, we were uh discouraged by the previous city solicitor so for the same reason so if i can just raise one one other quick point um uh, that has been discussed a few times is the the health care aspect and their two-year or one-year extension I, I apologize um you know i don't want to take away anything from healthcare uh situations they've absolutely gone above and beyond what they've been asked uh, for during this pandemic. Um, the only thing that I would bring to note in that conversation is that uh, hospitals, healthcare workers, et cetera, are corporately funded um, and they're at this and probably have the staffing to be able to make these changes a lot sooner than I do because I spend 70 hours a week on a, on a hotline uh, that I don't have time to go call vendors and manufacturers and the like. Uh, it'll be significantly easier for hospital workers and corporate affiliates to 
make these changes than the small business worker will. That was my excellent final. point. Excellent point. Um, so we're uh, discussing timeline. Actually, uh, I don't know if you noticed that it snuck in there. Uh, uh, Councillor Maori proposed um, essentially tabling the conversation um, for referral out of this committee. And, and Noah had mentioned something similar, but uh, uh, Councillor Maori. No, I just going to uh, my my original suggestion. Uh, we can entertain that. My original suggestion was to. Um, to delay bringing it to council, that didn't mean that we couldn't um, continue to, we couldn't vote tonight at legal, uh, at um, legislative matters. I guess there's two different. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, we could. We, I, I'm kind of well, anxious to get it to full council because I, I can see that the other councils really want to participate and they've been part of this journey. So I, I guess part of me is thinking, it, um, you know, it would be good to move this at least to full council where we it would be, um, we'd have more uh, heads at the table with us to discuss it. Well, currently we are, we are on, we have on the floor a motion to extend the timeline as, as per your amendment. Yes, right. Um, uh, Noah, you have one other thing to contribute to this? Today? Yeah, well, maybe we could just, maybe we should wait on this, um, but this is something to address. I had an idea about addressing the medical care thing that's been brought up and I think what was just brought up by Mr. Werther was a really, that was an excellent point that I don't think we thought of honestly and is uh, very, sounds super, super right to me. Um, so I was gonna make a suggestion about that, but maybe, I mean, it's up to Rachel since you, you would be the one to make the motion, but yeah. I don't know if you wanted to do that. I guess that would be a separate amendment because that's a different well, part right, of the ordinance. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yes, so actually, you, okay, so it's, I'll, it's I'll related. I know I'm tempted, but I see that, let's, yeah, I'm, I'll, We'll maybe try we, maybe it, it does one. impact perhaps the, the debate around the start date, but um, the possible extension of exemptions or changing of the exemption. Well, there can be an amendment to the amendment, believe it or not. You can be, if you want to modify your amendment and it receives a second, then we can do that. I'm not, no, not the start date. I was talking about exemptions. Um, Got it. Right. right. About the, the medical versus uh, business exemptions and bringing them into line or, yeah. Okay. So uh, you can let, let me know when the appropriate time. Uh, right after our vote on the amendment. How's that? Sure. Um, any other discussion on this? All right. The, the amendment is to extend the date to January 1st, 2022. Uh, Laura, please call the roll. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. All right. So that amendment passes. Uh, Councillor Mayori, you're yes, on. Yes. Yeah. Um, move to um, add, recommend that we make like four six month exemptions as opposed to. So that would be for everybody, right? For everybody. Mm -hmm. For everybody, everybody, right? Excuse me. Yeah. Yes. So, all right. So, currently, you have in in the law um, specified exemption for medical. So, you'll have to delete that, right? And then, um, and then propose that it be across the board exemption for all applicable establishments, right? Yeah, would you like me, Phil, would you like me to share my screen and show everybody where that is? Sure. Okay. Uh-oh, my dog. That's okay. To, the solicitor's dog is barking too as well, so. <laughs> Early, uh -huh. quiet, please. Oh, so here we have our exemption section. And um, <clears throat> we have here that the mayor's designee may exempt a food or retail establishment from the requirements of this ordinance for a period of up to six months upon a finding by the mayor's designee that the requirements of this ordinance would cause undue hardship to the establishment. Um, the mayor's designee may approve one additional six month period upon the showing of a continu continued undue hardship. Um, and so I think what we would wanna change here would be the mayor's designee may approve um, up to three additional six month periods upon the showing of 
a continued undue hardship. And then we would have here, uh, we would strike um, this sentence right here pertaining specifically to Medicare care, medical care facilities and just provide everybody the same across the board um, exemption there. And I can I can write that up if it makes sense to do it that way. Um, yeah, let me see that. Um, yeah, so at the beginning, the mayor's designee may exempt a uh, food or retail establishment or uh, or medical establishment. You would add that into there. Right. I'm not sure if that is. I'm not sure if that is necessary because the prohibitions rec only apply to food and retail establishments and the medical care facility is we're treating as a only only in its role as a subset of a food as of a food establishment if you get my drift mm -hmm. which is that it's only the food establishment that's providing food part of the right right, right. Um, okay. and so the only reason we even define medical care facility was so that we could grant them um, additional okay. accommodations okay no that that makes sense well, would we want to eliminate medical care facilities from the definitions as well? If we don't yeah. need the definition, we should remove it. That's right, yeah. Alan. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So the deletion should include uh, removal of the medical facilities definition and then also the clause under the exemptions relative yeah. to medical facilities. And we'll have uh, so. That's your motion. Yes. Is there a yes, second? Yes, my motion. Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. For purposes of discussion, how's that? <laughs> Didn't sound like a ringing endorsement. So, yeah, Council Shara. Um. Well, I mean, I, uh, I, I am interested in bringing these in line, but I'm mindful of what um, I think. Kathy was saying in regards to what Rich had also been talking about, about um, one, that it's not a guarantee that you'll get, you'll be granted an exemption, two, potential fees associated with them. Um, and so, I mean, I guess, and just being mindful of the moment that we're in, in terms of uh, COVID in the world. And, and so, if I were to, what maybe I would be more comfortable with would be a, a one year exemption and then go to six month, um, then add the six month, um, uh, you know, a possibility to have it renewed at six month periods. But that the initial one to help get people through this time period would be a year. So, um, it would just give them a little more cushion. Um, rather than apply for an exemption or a further exemption. Right, and, um, and perhaps they, they wouldn't have to apply for a further exemption after that point, but just instead of going in six month chunks to do an initial year um, if they need, um, and then move to having to apply for potentially a, a six month renewal. Uh, do, do we still have Amy? Do we lose Amy? Yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you're there. Okay, I'm sorry. There you are. <laughs> it's just a, like looking at the Brady Bunch here. The, um, you have a sense of how many people would be interested in applying for an exemption? Are you thinking that it's every single restaurant or, or food establishment in the city? I have no idea. I mean, no idea. I, I, I know that's not helpful, um, no, but I really right. don't. I, I don't know. That's what, an answer. What, where okay. are you headed for? I liked. Well, to... I was just saying, it, it, you know, honestly, if there were a universal, if there were a universal appeal for an exemption, then why not build just build into the law? But if it, if it's well, I if it's actually if go ahead. I think we have maybe Jim and I and maybe Noah, we have had conversations about if it's something everybody is going to be looking for an exemption for, why are we creating the exemption? Why don't we just recognize whatever that issue is? Um, and I don't know that we necessarily know what those issues or exemptions are other than the straw bucket, straw 
issue. I don't know if that's getting at what you're aiming for, but I had, since I have the floor tenuously, can I ask a question as well? Which is, yes, is there a reason? I mean, I can guess at the reason why, but I'm wondering if the extension period, if the health department could be given the um, ability to just sort of issue those exemptions as they are warranted and why there is only the two or however it's now been amended to four exemption periods so that ultimately at the end of two years or something nobody's going to be eligible for any exemption if I'm reading this correctly other than the straws and I'm wondering why that is uh nobody you have a response to that or yes, actually I do. yeah yeah okay Oh, I'm sorry, do you, not, you want to call on somebody else? Well, I, I want to, uh, Council Chair, do you have your hand up to respond to that? Um, I did, no, I don't remember what I was gonna say. Well, I, I guess I just want to point out that with, with these additional exemptions, we're now talking about potentially like, could be like a three year period out, right? So that should be noted, um, which hopefully will give more time for finding um, the resources that are needed and, and the alternatives that are needed. Oh, and I just, this is a completely anecdotal thing, but I've actually been very impressed, um, just my own observation the last couple of years with how many places that um, I've gotten takeout from that have already made this change. So I, I'd be really interested to know if there's any data or Noah, when you were um, reaching out, you know, if you have any any sort of stats or can give us any numbers on places that that are concerned about this um because i'm not you know to to your point amy i'm not sure that this is an exemption that everyone would need to take advantage of i don't actually think that that's the case i think a lot a lot of restaurants have started to already make that move and maybe they'd need to do some tweaks but i, I think there's a lot more um already people that are in compliance already than, than maybe we're, we're sort of talking about or recognizing. All right, Noah, yeah, I think it's gonna to be more. To. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. go ahead. Amy, you, wanna, you wanted to. I was just gonna say, I think it's gonna be more situation specific with things that can't, like this particular lid that can't cover something yeah. or this, you know, hot sauce that has to go in this kind of container and there is no, you know, substitute. And I just have no handle on how many of those specific instances exist citywide. Right. So let me try to let me try to respond to everything. Um, the first thing was from Amy, and it was why do we have a cap? What was our thinking about a cap on exemptions in the first place? Um, well, to answer this, let me. I'll I'll just I'm going to mention for one second a meeting that um, myself, as well as Rachel, as well as Renna and Marty had with um, an East Hampton City Councilor Owen Zaret um, a few days ago. Um, Owen Zaret was the, uh, Councillor Zaret uh, was the lead on their plastic reduction, I don't remember exactly what they called it, but plastic ban ordinance that they just passed, what was it, October? Somebody can correct me on that. Um, and we were asking them specifically about how they dealt with this specific issue. Now they had a, a slightly different um, model. Uh, their model included A, no cap on exemptions, so potentially unlimited exemptions. It included B, uh, not necessarily six month exemption. So it could be like the, the, the body could, and they actually had their deciding body be the city council, which I thought was a little bit uh, interesting to have the city council have to individually uh, deliberate on every single exemption, but that's how they chose to do it. And they had up to six months. So our thinking, our thinking about why not to do it that way um, is for a couple of reasons. The first of which is that we do want this to be an ordinance. Um, and so we want this to be something that people have to comply with at some point in, in totality, because the point of this is to change habits, is to change business habits and to change consumer habits and to shift in that direction. Um, the other thing is that um, we're concerned that if there is a specific product, um, that if there is a specific product that can't be shifted um, and the market just isn't adjusting in that way, like, that's, you know, if, if we, if there's a specific lid, let's say, you know, for example, we talked with Belly of the Beast, which was, and this actually connects to what I'm going to answer Councillor Shara's um, question in a second, but we talked to Belly of the Beast, which is a business that is very much in support of this ordinance and already um, doing their absolute darndest to be in complete um, compliance with these terms. They were like, there's one kind of jar or there's one kind of jar that we use to, you know, cool a specific pudding um, that we just can't find an alternative to. 
And so our thinking around the, the um, exemptions is like, okay, let's give them a couple years. Let's see if the market can adapt. Um, hopefully more cities and states and maybe even the federal government will be moving this direction very soon. So hopefully the market will adapt to that product, right? But if we get to a point of, initially it was gonna be two years, now it might be three years if this uh, amendment is adopted. If we get to a point where it's three years out and there's no market alternative, then that might be the time that you have to change, that we have to change the menu, right? That might be the time we have to find a different uh, container because at the end of the day, we're all trying to move in a certain direction and we're trying to change habits over the long term. That said, that should not be a decision. We should not be forcing restaurants to change their menu in the middle of this economic crisis. Absolutely not. And so that's the thinking around a certain limited amount of exemptions. And it's starting to sound like a period of two years, whether it's as Councillor Mayori um, proposed or as Councillor Sierra has proposed to amend to, you know, a first one year. Um, that, that should be enough to see whether uh, the market will adapt to that specific product or not. Now let me move into Councillor Sierra's question, which is um, specifically around how many businesses do we have numbers? Um, I'm going to uh, say a brief thing and then see if Marty or Rena have more specific or Eli. We don't have we don't have any kind of representative data just because we reached out to a lot of people and some people responded and some people didn't. Um, what we do have is I know of I think maybe oh actually Councillor Nash could also answer to this question because he yeah. did a bunch of walking around and talking to folks. Um, I know of maybe five or six businesses which are already in, in near total compliance. Um, that's including Belly of the Beast and Iconica Cafe and Wood Woodstar and Haymarket and uh, Local yeah. Burger and East Side Grill and a couple others that I'm not thinking of. Um, I don't have good data. I know a lot of people are also moving in the right direction and are already planning on getting there, maybe by a timeline that's shorter or longer than we're laying out. Uh, Councillor Nash, do you have any numbers that you recall? I know you said that a bunch of businesses you talked to were moving in this direction. I don't have specific numbers. Um, I did uh, speak to a lot of businesses that were not showing up to, and engaging in our discussions, largely because they were already in compliance, they felt. That why would they show up to a meeting to discuss prohibitions that they already <laughs> they're already following. So, and that tended to be the cafes, uh, any place that served coffee, sandwiches, uh, things like that. Um, the, um, Amy and I had talked about using uh, recycling works to uh, collect some data uh, that uh, coming up with a sample of businesses where recycling works would go in and, and do some assessments and then report back to us to kind of say, you know, oh, here's where the problem materials actually are. Um, and that, um, like that belly of the beast pudding cup, or um, in the case of Judy Harrell, her, the, the tops for her Sundays. Um, and, um, and with Rich Cooper, the, um, the sealable uh, containers for, I think he, for his pesto, or is that right? Pine nuts. Pine nuts. <laughs> and that, um, yeah, so there's all of these particulars out there and we, we don't know what they are. And that, um, and so, and, and as we go through this process, we're, we're starting to find that out. Um, you know, it's one of these situations where when you say you're gonna do something, um, you know, like have an ordinance like this, people start saying, showing up and they start saying, well, what about this? And then I, th I think maybe having some sort of process where um, those exemptions can be considered because they're, you know, the, the tops on those Sunday cups and, uh, you know, they're part of the business. They're part of the culture of selling the product. And until a new product comes along to replace that, you know, we, we don't want to put it an, an undue hardship but on, on a business. But if... If there's a reasonable product out there that's similar to it, that's what we're hoping will happen here, that we can start to have that shift. So, um, so I don't have data specifically, but I, that could be something that we could be, I, I think it would be really helpful to get that. Recycling works would be a really good way to get it. Um, Jeremy, I'm, I'm sorry, you had, you had uh, said that you are, uh, you know, through your own moral impulse, 
have been trying to comply with this before it even existed as law. And you had said that there were some challenges that that presented to you. Yeah, I mean, we, we um, I, I think outside of our straws, all of our takeout uh, containers, bags, et cetera, would, would fall on the positive side of this ordinance. Um, and like you said, I, you know, morally, I believe that this is an absolute necessity. Um, I also know that, uh, you know, Noah mentioned it's at one point, you know, that, that again, belly of the beast has this container that, you know, it might not be compatible to, to remove the ability to sell an item because I am banned from utilizing a specific container could be highly detrimental to my business. It sounds like it's going to be highly detrimental to Judy's uh, business over at Harold's, you know, so um, I, I do believe that there's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I can't speak for the, the entirety of the industry, but I do know that a lot of places have made positive changes towards recyclables, compostables, et cetera. Um, but there are just, you know, it, it all comes back around to the ability to operate the business. Uh, if I can't give you a plate of pasta that's gonna stay hot, you're not gonna buy it from me. Um, and, then, and then I'm gonna go out of business. Um, you know, so these, these are, real life examples, not that they push one way or the other, but they are real life examples uh, of both the, the needs of the, our abilities to operate and, and offer a service, um, uh, you know, coupling with the necessary changes to the environment uh, and, and to save the environment. Council Nash. Yeah, um, I, I want to share something that uh, Clint Richardson from Brookline shared with Community Resources. Um, and that he's basically the wisdom was don't be perfectionistic, that get your ordinance through, have it, have it, have it be meaningful and push your community in the right direction, but figure out a way so that there can be exemptions uh, for, uh, you know, for your businesses. And that um, that you know perfection will um, will will bring it down. But if we if we can figure out a way to you know follow his wise advice, um, and and I'm not sure I I quite see it here yet um, around the exemption so that Rich can sell his pesto um, or no his pine nuts, pine nuts. and that um, <laughs> but. That, uh, but if we can figure that out, I think what the, the support will very much broaden here. You just described the essence of every law. You, you cannot strive for perfection and ameliorate every impact and anticipated outcome. Evie's the question of, you know, is, <laughs> are you making a cataclysmic decision in choice? Is it something that actually uh, is unconstitutional or unlawful? Those, I mean, those are the points. You're absolutely right. Your that that advice is absolutely right. That you cannot give up the good for the perfect. So that's what we're struggling with here now. So as proposed, now Councilor Shara didn't make a. There's not a motion no. beyond the motion no. that that. Yes, Councilor Shea. I'm happy to, to make a motion to amend, but I just want to know, I don't know if you can see, but Marty's had her hand up for quite a while. No? Marty. I, I saw I Marty walking it. around the room. Got covered. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> uh, can I just clarify Shea. one quick? I'm sorry. Sure. Before, sure. so before Councilor Shea makes that amendment, I just do want to clarify that as it's currently written, the amendment is um, up to six months. So that means that you would apply and presumably whatever form the mayor's designee would provide to you would ask you how long you were looking for an, for an exemption. And then, you know, hopefully the uh, mayor's designee within reason would respect that. But there would not be, for example, you could be granted a three month exemption or a five and a half month exemption. So I just wanna make that clear in case that changes what Councilor Shiera was thinking about her amendment to the amendment. Thank you. Um, so I guess I would propose as an amendment to Councilor Mayori's amendment that, hold on, let me pull it up, um, that the under exemptions, 
it would say the mayor's designee may exempt a food or retail establishment from the requirements of the ordinance. Um, when actually, uh, since we're folding in medical to here, do we, we maybe want to change that regardless, right? That first line <clears throat> so that it encompasses medical care facilities. Um, so maybe it's just is May and Alan can tell me if this covers all of it, but if we just take out, you know, just say uh, may exempt an establishment um, from requirements of this ordinance for a period of up to one year. Um, and then moving to the next sentence, the mayor's designee may approve. And I think we were saying then two or I guess it was three. If you started with six and then you added three, then that would be two years. But since we're making this one, we to then get into the, <laughs> then be two. So um, may approve two additional six month periods upon the showing of a continued undue hardship. Right, so in effect, since we've already modified the date of initiation, that with those exemptions, someone theoretically could extend out to three years, I think is what you were saying. If all those were granted, that would be three years. Is there a second to the amendment? Second. Councilor Thorpe is a second on that. So let's discuss that. Any discussion? Or is everyone okay with that? I'm happy with what uh, Councilor, uh, Council President Sierra has presented. Any thoughts from anyone else on the committee? Okay. No, Laura, would you? you... <laughs> it's okay. It was just, uh, I was uh, talking while I was muted, but I was just saying, yes, I, I appreciate Councilor Shiara uh, doing that. Okay. <laughs> Laura, would you call the roll on that vote? Councilor Please. Maiori? Yes. Councilor Thorpe? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. And Councilor Shara? Yes. Okay. That amendment passes. Um, all right. Here's the thing. We're at what? It's 10 after 11 after 8, to be precise. Um, we actually still have a ways to go. <laughs> so, uh, well, actually, Noah, you want to give me an inventory of how many uh, two. further amendments? Two more amendments? No, no, one. Okay. Oh, oh, grammar. One, right? We had a gram. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Grammar. We, have a very, we have one which should take very little time, which were just a typo that we found and another quick word I guess change. Dry cleaning is there's a dash in dry. Can we do that first to give everybody a, a, a break <laughs> well, from just, thinking? That's just, just to let you know, those are not amendments. Those are Scribner's errors. So if you'll oh. just forward them to Laura, she can oh. have, put them in the correct end. So. And if we're doing Scribner's, Bill, as you noted, D has a five, which has nothing. Right. Uh, that was one of them. That remove yeah. that that's, that's one so should Although i just along hmm? sorry the other well the other one pro the other one kind of uh walks the line in between substantive and not in that you could think it's substantive if you didn't know that it was a mistake well what is that actually <laughs> um right. that is in uh the definition for disposable food service where it wouldn't change i don't think it would change anybody's interpretation of the ordinance um, but we could still talk about it if you'd like. Well, sure. Why don't you, yeah, let's get s specific here. So we'll determine whether it's a Scribner error or if it requires an amendment. Okay. All right. Let me share my screen then. Should be quick either way. So this one is um, pretty simple. It's here. Uh, and actually, I don't know, does Marty want to talk about it? Because this was something that Marty identified. Marty, I can talk about it if she's not you, present. You, you go ahead. No. Okay. Um, the basic thing is we have here all containers, bowls, plates, trays, cartons, cups, lids, straws, stirs, forks, spoons, knives, and other items. That's parts fine. Um, the issue here is uh, it has here one designed for one time or non durable uses, and then it separates this from the next two items all with ors, um, implying that any one of these three items, were it to be true, would qualify the the item as a disposable food service where, which I think if you take a close scrutiny at the language of doesn't make sense uh, because 
you wouldn't just have a container that is used to consume foods automatically count as disposable food service where that was just a mistake on our end. So um, the solution so is... To I'm sorry, replace the ors with, I was going to suggest that you should replace the ors with and. Yeah, the solution that we came to was delete number, because we actually do want these two to be separated by ors. So the solution was okay. just to delete number one um, and then incorporate this, uh, this dependent clause here into this part and then just do and one or two. Um, so okay. just have these two items as ors and have this one as part of the previous sentence with an and. Well, let's just to be safe and let's propose that as an amendment instead of just because it is a little more, slightly a little more substantive. Um, so the proposal is now to um, delete item number one and move it up into the body of uh, essentially identifying items and then reorder the two remaining as one and two. Yeah. Second. And that's about, well, actually, oh. uh, somebody else oh, want to make that motion? Yes. That I, a motion? I, I, okay. <laughs> I, I move, uh, I move to make those changes. Okay. Second. A, a second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on those items? Uh, Laura, please call the roll. Um, Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Mayori. Yes. Okay. All right, Noah, what's your last um, item? Uh, the last one, that? I've been talking a lot. Does somebody else from our team want to present the last one? Yeah, I can present the last one. All um, right, Eli, you're on. Opt-in is correct. Opt-in. Yeah, so let yeah. me share my screen, Eli, yeah. and you can read the amendment and then talk about it, okay? Sure. Unless we want to have, do we want to have Rachel read it yeah, and you talk about it? If it's going to be a proposed amendment, then uh, uh, a sure. committee member has to make that. And it is somewhat, somewhat, somewhat long here. So I'll we'll right. let Rachel read it. Right. Um, I'm actually going to read it. Let's just make sure I have the right. Okay, I'll just read from here. The, uh, the sponsors move that the, pl the plastic reduction and sustainability ordinance is amended as follows. One, by adding the following as an eighth item in section B. Food establishments must provide disposable food service um, wear accessories only upon request by customers or at a self-serve station. A, online food ordering platforms that take orders of prepared food for pickup by uh, or delivery to customers in the city of Northampton are required to provide options on their ordering platform that enable customers to choose which dispos disposable food service wear accessories to include with each order. When no options are selected by the customer, the default practice shall be that no disposable food service wear accessories are provided. The platform must provide the food establishment an option slash method for listing a customized list of accessories that are offered by each food establishment listed on their platform. B, for delivery orders, food establishments may choose to include specific accessories such as cup lids, um, spill plugs, and trays in order to prevent spills and deliver food beverages safely. Two, by adding the following as new definitions titled disposable food service wear accessory and online food ordering platform, respectively, directly after the definition of um, disposable food wear, food service wear, online food ordering platform, the digital technology provided on a website or mobile application through which a customer can place an order for pickup or delivery of prepared food. Such platforms include those operated directly by, uh-oh, uh -oh. Well, my, we oh, okay, it's back. I can, I have it in hard copy, but I want to make sure I'm reading the, okay. Such platforms. Sorry, that's my those, bad. That's, that's okay. Such platforms include those operated directly by food establishments, by companies that provide delivery of prepared meals, to consumers, and by online food ordering systems that connect consumers to prepared food vendors directly. Disposable food service wear accessory. All types of disposable food service wear provided alongside prepared food, included but not limited to utensils, chopsticks, napkins, cup lids, cup sleeves, 
food or beverage trays, condiment cups and packets, straws, stirs, splash sticks, and cocktail sticks. The, this does not include such items that are necessary for the containment of food, such as plates, bowls, and bags. Uh, move to approve move this to amendment. Recommend. recommend. Is there a second? Second. A second. Okay. Uh, Council Miori. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say very quickly that um, part of our thinking, and this was, it actually would save businesses money, just if they didn't have to provide things that were unnecessary or, or not not wanted. Has yeah. the solicitor as a solicitor seen this language? I have not. She yeah, has, it's not. Has... Uh, this was language closely taken from. Uh, model legislation. Can somebody remind me what where the model legislation was from? Um, I want to say it's from. Yeah. It's from it, it, no, it, it came from Berkeley. It came from the West Coast. Oh, okay. Okay, so we have we have to be careful because we're not California. So, uh, Alan, um, as as you observed or or heard, um, any thoughts or objections or concerns? <clears throat> Uh, I would certainly want to give, be given a chance to review this. Uh, it's, it went by awfully quickly to start picking out legal issues and analyzing them. So um, in the possible, with the possibility that this is not the last night of this discussion, and if that were the case, I would certainly appreciate it, an opportunity to, uh, to review this in, with a little, a little more de deliberately. Okay. Shall I rescind? Um, yeah. or you want to but let me. Well, we have two options here. We can we can continue this discussion and until our next meeting, which actually is not until uh, second week in, in January, or we can move it forward without this amendment and in such time that would allow Alan to review it and it would come up before the council meeting on Thursday, um, and. That would give them a, a couple of days to review it and see if it passes muster. Um, unless you all think that the, and I don't know where you all sit with the, the debate and the discussion, if you're prepared to vote with a recommendation. So what's the preference here? Can Council Shara. Um, just having spoken to Alan earlier, and I know that he's got a very full plate. Can we just ask Alan if that's feasible to be able to give feedback by Thursday on that? I can do that. Thank I you. I figured though. he would have he would have cussed me out if I I was a pretty confident he would have cussed me out. Too polite for that. I've had yeah, better reasons true. for cussing you out, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give it time. Um, uh, someone else had their hand up. Oh, was it? Councilor Nash just scratching his head? Okay. Um, what what's so, Councilors. Do you want to um, continue this discussion uh, until our next meeting? Until with, uh, which, as I said, will it will? So this would not come up on the council agenda at the next meeting if we do continue, and it would, in all likelihood, come up on the second meeting in January, which would leave us a final vote in the first week of February. Um, when you say um, first. Week in January. Are you talking full council, or are you talking legislative matters? I'm sorry, I'm getting a little legislative matters. Legislative matters okay. doesn't meet until until what's the date, Laura? I think it's January 10th. Would okay. be the second Monday. Okay, so we will have already had a council meeting by then. So could, right. just, could uh, be the ninth, actually. But we're in uh, the interim. There will be two council meetings, which this would not be on the agenda. Just just to be clear. Councilor, oh, <laughs> Solicitor Seawald. Can, can I ask the committee um, whether this is something you want to take up? Uh, I, and I think we discussed this, uh, I discussed this with the committee way back when. I'm not really sure why these definitions are not in alphabetical order. So if we're going to continue this, uh, uh, I would ask to consider making that amendment because when you're looking for a definition, you don't want to be reading through every definition to find your definition. Putting them in alphabetical order would be very helpful. 
And I didn't mean to throw that in out of left field, but if you're not going to continue, then that's something I'll, I'll recommend that the council do. Uh, Fair enough. Uh, the only hand I actually saw go up first was Amy's, but then now Council Chair has her hand up, and she is she's the committee member, so she gets deference. So. I was just going to say I'm I'm either I'm fine with either option, though. If we continue it to legislative matters in January, um, maybe we request uh, a different time to. Because as we've heard, it's it's hard for restaurant owners to come during sort of the dinner rush. Council meets a little bit later, still certainly during dinner time. Um, it's hard to come up with a time that that's not. Well, you know, the, it's not gonna the the, the, the one upside of COVID is that we don't need to reserve a room, and um, so mm -hmm. there is some more flexibility. We could actually even convene earlier, but I want I mean, uh, Amy or, or Jeremy or Rich, you have any recommendations as to when would be a good time to convene a meeting that would get as many uh, stakeholders engaged? Jeremy's hand is raised, I believe. Yeah, I was, I'm highly confused about the amendment, so I just didn't, I didn't want to jump in, but. Um, okay. I would, I will, I will, I, I'm probably the wrong guy to ask because my restaurant is, is currently closed and I am I'm flexible in the same sense that you are. I don't need a room. Um, uh, the, the answer to your question is all time suck for restaurant owners. <laughs> right. There's no good time right. for these conversations. Right. Uh, late at night is our bread and butter, but you know, I understand that we're a, we're a different kind of human being here. Well, it's a, as I know, the, the, there's, there's prep and everything else that has to do, and it's not like uh, restaurant owners are sitting idly around waiting for dinner to show up. Oh, no, so, we're it, busy on yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, Amy, any thoughts? I mean, I really, I, I think it's fair. I think it's a fair knock, but I also think, um, you know, I, I'm just looking at the optimal time again, not the perfect yeah, time. I mean, I, there is no good exist. time. There is no good time, but I, my experience suggests that maybe. Uh-oh. Frozen, Amy. Frozen. Amy's frozen. Well, in the meantime, we'll go to Rich. Yeah, I would say July. <laughs> what time, July? <laughs> um, I don't know. Early July is good. Okay. Um, thank you, Rich. Um, um, hopefully, we're getting busy, and then uh, at that point again. Yeah. We hope so. Actually, if it's, a, I mean, here's the thing is that according to our rules, uh, we have to move this forward. We either have to kill it or move it forward. And I know that I know where you would fall on that choice tree, but um, we, we are not allowed to keep it dormant in a committee. That, that's up to the state legislature. They do stuff like that. Yeah. We, by our rules, cannot. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, no, All right, uh, Councilor Maori. Well, no, maybe no. I was just going to say, you know, I've I've said frankly, I, I I'm anxious to get this to the full council, and if this um, opt-in review, you know, I'm not sure how that works, but um, I think it would be um, good to get it out of legislative matters if possible, um, into, into yeah. the full council. Even if that means I think I was going to say something after similar. The oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Rachel. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Noah. I think I was going to say something similar, which is just that it seems to me like a lot of the we obviously since well since we're now talking about whether to make a motion, it's not it hasn't been appropriate for us to explain why we're proposing this amendment or what it is. Right. But at at such time as we're able, I think like. I don't remember who said this, Marty, maybe. I think it's, I think this is an amendment that actually makes it, that ease it. I think, I mean, it doesn't necessarily ease the load per se, but it's not something that is is more restrictive. It's just uh, specifying and something which completely falls in line with what we've heard from lots of businesses and just reduces waste without really adding an extra restriction other than just like, you know, just ask people if they want utensils when they're ordering. So um, I, I guess my thinking then, what that leads me to is, it seems like a lot of the the rest of the stuff, aside from this final amendment that we want to present, the rest of the stuff that we want to talk about is very much 
deliberative about actually like whether we should pass this ordinance. And it seems to me, obviously not being a city council, not being an expert, that city council is a good place to do that. And also then that uh, other councilors like Councillor Nash and like Councillor LaBarge who have been, and, and Councillor Foster have been very involved in the conversation can then get involved. So I wonder if um, I, I, from on the youth commission side, I guess I would say my thinking would be um, do this in in do this in full council. Uh, this amendment we can present it then, or Rachel can present it then, or whatever is appropriate based on that procedure. Um, and then we can move out of legislative matters and and then figure out whether we want it, whether it makes sense to do it on Thursday, or whether, as you know, Rich um, requested and Rachel mentioned, uh, you know, we we push it off to January seventh after the holidays. Um, seems to me like it's it's a good next step to go to full council, but that's just the youth commission's um, thinking. Thank you. Uh, other thoughts? I guess what I don't know, um, uh, Councilor Dwight, is is there an issue with, since we are having a meeting this Thursday, can you, um, can we vote on something tonight to move the council and then not have it, and then delay it till, um, after, you know, delay at a meeting? I just don't know the logistics of that. Is that your preference? You want to delay it? You don't want it? Well, to I mean, I guess I, I, I would, maybe we should discuss that. I mean, it's a two reading, you know, the, the, there's Thursday and then I believe our next meeting is the seventh. Um, well, uh, no, I mean, I'm just trying to think of all options. Um, well, it's, it is the council president's uh, prerogative. The council president establishes okay. the agenda and that would be up to her. Right. Although, well, although she, she to hearing what you all have to say. Uh, and, and the council president can't, by our rules, can't ignore an item indefinitely. It has to be done in a timely fashion. Okay. But if, if the council president were to choose not to include it on the agenda for stated reason, I, that would be, that'd be okay. I, I'd certainly I, be willing to respect a request to hold it till the first January meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, Council Thorpe. I think it would be best to uh, have it in January. Got it. Um, okay, so that almost sounds like consensus without a vote so far. Um, so then it seems to me that the consensus is to proceed with a recommendation vote and uh, with in holding fire on the uh, last amendment to, to be discussed on the council floor after it is reviewed by the solicitor. Uh, am I correct in that uh, assessment? Does that sound right to everybody? Yes. All right. Any further discussion on the order in the whole? No other discussion. Okay. The vote is to send forward with a recommend a, 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 a positive recommendation to the city council. As amended. As amended. Thank you. Laura, would you please call the roll? Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. That is done. Okay. Um, there, let me get back to my pathetic phone agenda that I believe is the last item. Now that we've, we've ticked off everything else, including a number of citizens. Um, so, uh, there's nothing, there's no new business. So there's can I just, one so item. I just, can I, so, yeah, yeah. so I just want to be clear. So that is the request that we don't take this up on Thursday. Everyone's in agreement, but that we take it up on January 7th. I heard an affirmative from Council okay. Maori and a Councilor Thorpe, and I'll yes. just add to that and say, sure, go for it. Yeah. Okay, so Laura, you got that. We will hold this. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Councilor Nash, we really... have no items that we're discussing. Is there something else you wanted to add to that? Well, I just wanted to, that I shared a possible amendment. Um, is this not the appropriate place to have that discussed or should that go to the council floor? Well, at this point, yep, 
it's going to the council floor. And to be honest, I think that's a more appropriate place to introduce it as, as you will be able to introduce it as a deliberator and debater on the, on the issue. I think that's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, but in fact is that the, the, we've already moved it <laughs> as amended. So we can't really start amending it now because it's the order's over. Does that make sense? The, the die is cast. Okay. Uh, so as I'm sneaking up to this last item that needs to be advanced and forwarded by a member of the committee with a motion. Motion to, to adjourn. Oh, there it is. Hello. So actually, Councilor Thorpe started it. So I'll give I'll him second the it. original motion and Council Shara second it. There is no debating this issue. So Laura, please call the roll on adjournment. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. And Councilor Thorpe. Yes.